Now yeah. Amber. We yeah. Before, you again. Just before yeah. Amber, can I say a few words before Amber leaves? Is she still yes. there? Go ahead, yeah. Melba. Amber, can you? Yeah. In your in your opening there, you mentioned Guego Oska quite often. Can you explain mm -hmm. what that is and why you say that? Many, many people around the table and around the reserve that are watching and hearing uh, don't understand this and don't internalize it and don't practice it. What is it right. that you're saying? Um, there, um, so it's just supposed to, for us, like um, Mohawk doesn't translate um, correctly to English. So it does get lost in translation a little bit, but it's supposed to be like we we're supposed to put our minds together for these things. Um, and people say like, like to make one mind, but it's just like more to bring ourselves together for this Thanksgiving address. Um, and it does get yeah lost in translation a little bit. Um, it just for all of us to come together and you know, it, it's um, just to look at these different pieces of the Thanksgiving address and to acknowledge, acknowledge for us to acknowledge everything. Um, just, I would like to teach, yeah, more. Um, and there's a lot more advanced speakers that can really, you know, change, make it to their uh, worldview, right? Um, but it's up to, like everybody does it different and this is just a, a faster, uh, simple, it's still long. I mean, when I say it's short, it's, it's still pretty, it's a lot. It's a lot of information to take in. Okay. Thank you, Amber. And thank I appreciate you. you describing and Melba, thank you for the question. So on mm -hmm. that, we will see you in, um, in a few weeks. Ona. Okay. Ona. Okay. Before we move over to Darren and the introductions, I just would like to also welcome the community who is joining us on uh, Facebook Live this evening. So this is our very first meeting. Please bear with us as we, um, you know, trial this out. So thank you. So Darren, I will allow you to have the floor. Michelle. Go ahead, Wendy. Is it active now? Because I'm getting messages saying that nothing's happening. Okay, on my computer, it says live on Facebook. So I'm assuming, so Candice. That's correct. Yes, it is live. We have 72 viewers so far. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Candace. Okay, on that note, I'll pass it over to Darren. Thanks, Michelle. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to quickly, uh, it won't take too much time, but just to, to formally introduce uh, Anna Cecile Perez. Uh, she just actually just started yesterday as our chief financial officer, and she had her first finance uh, committee meeting yesterday morning as well, which was packed with with lots of stuff and uh, I think she she's a very quick study from what I've, I've been able to, to tell so far she had a great job in her interview and I think she's doing great work with the team already identifying areas for improvement um, and just kind of getting grabbing the ball and going to really be a great asset uh, to the senior team in terms of that long longer term strategic planning that we've been talking about for some time and I participated in that meeting this morning which was also a very good discussion. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to her contributions, uh, not only at the senior level, but also for, for leadership to inspire uh, confidence and in, in where we're heading into the future. So with that, I'll turn it over to Anna Cecile. And uh, some people call her Anna, but she actually is Anna Cecile. And I'll, I'll let her give a bit more background on, on herself and, uh, to, to, you know, and just to give a bit more insight into where she comes from and what, what experience she brings. So go ahead, Anna Cecile. Thank you so much, Darren. Uh, thank you so much for giving me uh, the time to introduce myself. My name is Anna Cecile, and I, I have a master in direction, 
and I have a CPA specialized in financial modeling and reporting. I have a vast experience in both accounting and finance. In Canada, I started working with the Government Council of the Salvation Army for Canada and Bermuda. I have also worked with York University, um, Alzheimer's Society of Canada, Alzheimer's Society of Ontario, and Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. I have also have been uh, lucky enough to work with Native Child and Family Services of Toronto. And uh, in my last position, I was a director in Roots of Empathy, which is a non-for-profit that has uh, organizations in several parts of the world. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to support uh, the, the, the community, Six Nations. I'm very glad and, you know, building a rapport with my team and with other directors. And I, at the moment, as Darren says, this is my second day. So I'm just at the process of gathering information in order to move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Welcome. Fantastic. And thank you, Anna Cecile. Welcome to Six Nations. And on behalf of the elected council, uh, we all look forward to working with you and in, in the future dialogue we will have. So welcome. Thank you so much, Michelle. Okay, um, with that, we will move on to number four, declaration of conflict. Does anybody have conflicts to declare at the onset of the meeting? Hearing none, as we go through the agenda, if there are conflicts, please declare them for yourself or you de declare for your colleague. So let's move along to our delegation. This evening, we have three um, pre presentations. So we are going to go with our first presentation of the evening is Indigenous Services Canada and Kathleen Manderville. Welcome, Kathleen. And I see um, a number of educators on the line this evening. And so what I will do is give you the floor. Thank you very much, um, Michelle. And thank you, uh, for the invitation to come this evening. Um, my name is Kathleen Manderville. I'm the director of the federal schools. So, so um, that's the elementary schools with the Six Nations and, uh, and uh, Tyendinaga territories. I have been here before and uh, um, talking about school and, and the whole time of COVID and, and what's going on. And I'm very pleased that tonight um, there are representatives from every one of the schools, uh, principals and vice principals from uh, ECG, from uh, Jameson and JC Hill are here. I see the vice principal, um, Mr. Gibson from IL Thomas. And um, also, um, let's see, and from OMSK, the, the principal and vice principal are, are here. Uh, in addition, I see some uh, representatives from our transition team committee uh, who've been very involved in the, the process of, of uh, preparing to open the schools. As well, um, I saw uh, Lacey uh, Venevri from uh, Public Health. And over the last uh, number of months, uh, since school opened with remote learning uh, in Six Nations, uh, there's been a, a continuous effort and teamwork to develop a plan uh, to open the schools in the safest way that can be. And uh, all of the people that are here tonight have been part of that on an ongoing basis. So this is a, a very much a team uh, teamwork involved in preparations. So I uh, just um, also wanted to note that um, our uh, policy lead and our the union president, uh, Mike Freeman, is also on the call tonight. And they're here um, so that if council has any questions, uh, that, that they can provide that information um, as well to provide a, you know, an understanding that this is a team effort. I just wonder if I can share my screen, if that would be, can I go ahead and do that? Or is it, does it need to be opened to do? I believe you can share your screen. It's okay. 
All right. Second here. Um, okay. So the purpose of my visit tonight, um, and and I see that you know you've got a very busy agenda. So just to go through where things are at this moment, um, we've introduced our school team. Present. Uh, a short rationale as to why uh, the concept of reopening schools needs to be looked at. And, and people may feel very, very differently on this. Um, some may feel that the schools should be opened right now, and some may feel that they shouldn't be opened all year, and, and everyone will have different feelings in between. So just a short uh, rationale looking at that, as well as describing what the model would be at opening, and of course, there will be parental choice. Um, remote learning will continue, uh, even when the schools are open to children coming in, and to provide an update of what's happening currently, what's done, what's yet to be done, and to request chief and council support to look at February 1st as an as a opening date uh, to target. And um, so I just wanted to take a moment and go through um, some of that information. Um, this is a, an analysis of some research around um, the reasons why opening or having children uh, attending school is very important. And uh, parents that are going through and struggling with some of the remote learning uh, know very well some of the challenges that they're dealing with. Um, and that the, the children being in remote for an extended period of time, um, it's, it is uh, very impactful for them in terms of their emotional needs. So um, this is taking a look at some of those areas uh, of increased stress of children uh, requiring that um, we know that mental health uh, has deteriorated. You know, I'm not talking specifically, I'm talking generally now. Uh, about about children across the board um, due to prolonged school absence um, as well that by being back in school is the promotion of of, uh, of children um, and their well-being and um, I, I know I mentioned in a visit that I was here earlier uh, back before school started looking uh, worldwide at research and how um, children have been uh, exposed or are, have been exposed to much more incidents of online bu bullying, um, human trafficking has increased, and uh, areas that, that have been uh, exploited due to children not being in school. Um, as well, the, you know, the, the difference between the children uh, with um, high-speed internet with access to every advantage and those children with fewer uh, economic advantages is also leading to a disparity in, in children's uh, learning and abilities. Um, next area, one of our prime concerns as well, we know that many children are not uh, hearing the language, um, Cayuga or Mohawk language on an ongoing basis the way they would be if they were in school on a regular um, day to day. Um, as well, uh, worldwide uh, increased of increases in violence uh, has been shown as well as uh, the uh, ability for a child to report that violence against them is, is decreased without children in school. So I, I know I'm going quickly through these items and, and you know that we could discuss this at length, but uh, just to give it a sense of the motivator for continuing to look at opening the schools. And, um, and so to share that with you. Uh, the opening model that we are looking at and, and have been continuously working with is a hybrid model where all the classes will be grouped by family so um, that they are all below 15 at the maximum, that the 
cohort groupings uh, would be siblings and family members attending school at the same time. So only half of the children would be in school at one time uh, while the other half are remote. And again, parents choose uh, which, which type of learning they want for their children. The goal of this is to um, minimize contact, to uh, have small groups of children with the same teacher throughout the day, um, practicing all of the proper protocols and the schools have been working incredibly hard to ensure that, that those protocols are known, that they're uh, that proper distancing of desks and plexiglass in place, uh, that face coverings or masks would be warned and followed throughout the day, uh, enhanced cleaning protocols and um, PPE worn by staff um, throughout, throughout the day. So this is a list of what sort of the opening model uh, includes and looks like. Um, it, the schools already look quite different and then there's directional arrows everywhere, uh, all uh, you know, unnecessary items <laughs> from the classroom and, um, and everything distanced. Uh, the hybrid model that we're talking about would look like this, where on uh, cohort A, uh, one group of students arriving um, face to face would be in school every Monday and Tuesday and alternating Wednesdays. Uh, cohort B would be in school every alternating Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. On the days they are not in school, they would be remote into their classroom with the same teacher and their same classroom group. Um, and that's what cohort A and B would look like. And cohort C would continue to be fully um, remote if that's what uh, the family chose. Um, right now, as of today, the classrooms are set up. There's plexiglass in place. All, all the cohort things are made. Uh, there's entry protocols in the school. So how the children will come off the bus, um, how they how they are staggered into the entry into the school so that cohort groups do not mix. Uh, there's plans for recess uh, so that um, the students are safe. And um, videos are being made by each school and some families may have already seen them posted on Edmodo pages to see the videos of what the schools look like, what the, what the um, protection looks like and, and some of those changes. Those videos will be continue to be made so that parents can, can see uh, what, what will look like for their child. Uh, personal protective equipment is ordered and coordinated. That's through public works. Um, they've assigned a, a, a person to take the lead on that. Each school has uh, um, PPE connections, uh, reps to meet with that uh, that uh, lead so that everything is uh, maintained and kept up. Uh, COVID response nurses are expected at every school and that's coordinated by public health. So that's where we are right now uh, as of today. Um, what needs to be done prior to students starting, um, COVID custodians need to be in place. So there's the current complement of custodians, um, but additional custodians need to be in place. It's currently reposted uh, to find more, um, more people to take on that role. Uh, we need to see three months supply of PPE on site um, and the nurses in the building. There's um, so that the, the nurses can further the training of staff, in, be involved in training with students. So come on their, their Zoom calls right now and, and, and prepare students for what, they're, what it will look like for them and provide support for the parents. Um, and we need to know the parental choices uh, of whether they want to be the hybrid, the A and B cohorts or stay remote. And then we will do our staff allocations based on that 
parental choice. So that information needs to be there. Um, what I'm asking of chief and council is support to have the target start date be February 1st so that those, those items can be fully uh, in place and uh, ready to go uh, and that every detail is addressed before the children walk in the building. In the school days, that's just 23 school days from now because we have um, at January 18th is the end of this, um, this sorry, th December 18th is the last day before school ends um, for a two week holiday. Um, we want to monitor the effects of those holidays and if the community you know, keeps doing what it's doing and the cases are low, that's, that's going to really affect school. Um, also, the schools take a break for midwinter and that year, this year that will fall on January 18th for that week. Um, that will allow the staff to be back in the schools the week following again to monitor what things look like. We will be able to complete um, term one report cards. So all of term one will be uh, done and documented and February 1st would be the beginning of term two. And that's, that's you know, a, a important for educators. It may seem that it's not important um, for schooling. However, um, depending on what parents choose, the teacher that their, their child is worth is with on uh, starting February 1st for term two may be different than the one they had in term one. So that way the report card is done, the parent knows where the child where the child stands and that's done by their current teacher and the term two um, startup would be would be uh, you know commensurate with, with the students attending in person, those who who, sh who uh, choose to. And uh, you know what's that's a, a lot of information and certainly uh, before school opens I would be absolutely uh, very pleased to come be invited back to council to again walk through the much more detailed uh, reopening plan. Uh, you've seen earlier versions of it. It's now with these constant weekly updates, it's gone from, you know, I think it was about a 25 page document and now it's close to 70 pages with all of the details of what's happening in the schools. Um, so certainly I would be very happy to come back and, and you know, bring the principals and we'll talk about that in more detail um, if time allows for you. Um, but so I, I, I apologize for going uh, so quickly through things, but I want to be mindful of your time. And um, at this point, um, if there's any questions or uh, that it's really about that February 1st to, to get your understanding or, or, or partnership in that. Audrey? Hello, everybody. I shouldn't, I shouldn't recognize you, right? You you are, sorry about that. And you, Kathleen. I just want to know how all the kids are doing, what their mindset is, and um, also how the staff are all doing and, and feeling about um, the online being home and then maybe we starting up on February 1st. Okay, so uh, you know what? I, I would really like you to hear from people working directly with the children, okay? Rather okay. than from this old mug. So um, <laughs> what I, I'm just gonna ask, uh, just OMSK, can you, how are, how are they doing? What's, what's happening for the kids? Sure, uh, thank you for having us. Um, it's, um, there's a range. Uh, I, I imagine you, you, you probably see this everywhere. There's a range of, of how folks feel about, about everything. Uh, I would say at our school, uh, people are feeling fairly comfortable. I don't wanna speak for everyone, but uh, people are feeling fairly comfortable about all of the things we're doing to keep them safe and to keep the students safe. Uh, I've been saying for, for a couple of weeks now to the staff that uh, you know students in the hallways uh, is the medicine we need. 
you know, and, and I think, you know, there's a lot of buy-in to that, uh, you know, although they're not going to be in the hallways that much because we're going to try and keep them in cohorts. Um, they, they really, we, we want to see the students back. And, and I truly believe that, uh, you know, on, on the day they walk back in the door, we are going to be able to, you know, with, with all of the things we've put in place and, and, and our ideas about, you know, uh, really focusing our, our attention on core subject areas that we're gonna have a great deal of success in catching them up, you know, because clearly they've, they've suffered, you know, because they haven't been in the schools for some time. But to anecdotally, you know, in talking to Quinty Mohawk, we know that we can make strides in, in closing gaps if we really focus our attention uh, in certain areas. So I, I think the children are also excited about coming back as well. Although we're doing a lot of different things to try and keep them engaged. We have some teachers that are doing virtual cooking classes. Other teachers are doing uh, partnering with Queen's University to deliver uh, science experiments, uh, you know, delivering those, those uh, tools and equipment out to their homes. Uh, I know that there's going to be a delivery tomorrow for some classes for some for some cooking. So there's all kinds of things that they're doing to keep the students engaged and interested. But of course, we want to reach all of the students. And I, I think the, the best way to do that will be, you know, to be able to open up our doors again in a safe uh, manner. But uh, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt everybody. I, I, I want to just thank Councillor Michelle Bombery for, for chairing the first portion of this meeting. I apologize for delaying my meeting went longer than expected. Uh, but I do, I, I, I caught the last little bit of Kathleen. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I want to shift over to Councillor Johnson. I see her hand up. Thanks, Chief. So, and thank you for the pre presentation, Kathleen. And certainly all the work that's gone into this from all of the, the educators. But I have a few questions that are outside of what you presented in terms of transportation. So what does the plan include for the children to get to and from school, uh, PPE? the to and from school and the transportation or even taking products home and having kits for families in the home, including PPE. Also, what's, what's happening to assist families in playing catch up? And I'll use an example of, of a child that I know that is grade four. Parents were working diligently with them thinking they're doing a great job, but made the choice to move them off the community to go to school and they tested at a 1.9 grade level. So three years behind. Um, so that's one child. I think with all the efforts of parents, that may be an issue coming up with the students and coming into a term two of report cards, you know, will that be a negative impact if they are at a lower level than what they should be? So looking at what, what's in place to assist families, assist parents with all of that, the, the toolkits. So what's the communication strategy as well that's going out to parents in terms of this transition and what's happening? Because there's a lot of unsureties. Uh, people are still skeptical about COVID in schools and there's a lot of worry. So what is going to happen with that, with the communication around it? Thank you. Uh, in terms of the uh, PPE on buses, uh, both uh, Lillian Miller buses and uh, uh, Sharp bus lines have been provided funding for PPE, for PPE on buses. Um, but also the busing with the cohort model, the busing is quite different in that um, there's the maximum of 22 on a bus uh, separated um, all the way down and it's with the cohorts as well. It's family groups that are bused together. So uh, with the protocols of, of uh, in terms of how, they're, how the students are um, seated on the bus, how they get, get on and off the bus as well, um, there's protocols for which uh, are, are in the, um, that will be in place. However, you know, parents, it is parents choice whether or not they choose to send them and whether or not they choose to send them on the bus. 
So I think that's important for, for parents to know. Um, in terms of catch up and that, that whole area of uh, particularly mathematics, um, literacy, and the, the um, of course, and, and the Mohawk and Cayuga language and cultural teachings. That's where our energies are going to go. And um, in this time, we've invested heavily in platforms to support that learning. So uh, in, in, in uh, great leap, leaps in reading for um, a reading, various remedi reading remediation program. And reading truly is number one, okay? In terms of um, student achievement, uh, it's, it's, if we can uh, continuously work with the reading and bring up reading, uh, that comes across all areas. So that's an area where we have um, put in place a number of, of uh, interventions, um, both level literacy intervention, great leaps in reading, as well as for all children uh, in the second term, we'll have uh, Lexia, uh, Lexia uh, reading power up and, um, and also um, symphony mathematics. Um, so, Sorry. so there's a number of different programs to support, uh, which you know we anticipate. There's there's definitely challenges for children having been off, you know, out of the school building this long. So so I guess uh, if if I can a subsequent. So yes. just I, I would I'm making an assumption that this is extremely challenging for our educators in working with students and trying to make up any difference if, if that be the case. So is the Department Indigenous Services Canada also providing additional services? to all of our classrooms and our teachers to help them. Human resources, not just programs, because this is a very challenging time and we need to work with our students and our learners and our parents. True, so uh, given that the increase in hiring, uh, we will have, we have an additional, uh, additional staff at every school at this point and we'll have uh, eight more additional staff on top of that when the students start reporting. so and add to that the small very there will be very small class sizes um so those are uh you know sort of the areas that we're looking at um wendy you also talked about a communication strategy um so having the parents so that the parents you know have good communication and know what they're looking at and that's where you know video evidence and pictures through um, through the Edmodo posted from the schools I think are very important. It's more than just publishing, you know, the reopening plan document. It's it's about um, the communication sort of at every level for the parents so they can see what things will look like, so they can uh, make a decision uh, that's informed. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kathleen and, and Wendy. Are there any further questions or comments from any counselors for Kathleen? I do. I do. It's Melba. Sure, sure. go ahead, Melba. Uh, Kathleen. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kathleen and the rest of the educators. We're working so hard to certainly educate our children under these difficult circumstances. You mentioned stress. And I get concerned about uh, bullying, and it's hit the papers uh, locally tonight. And uh, I'm concerned about that because uh, the relationships are going to be strained as they are in the community. People are very anxious uh, among each other concerning COVID. And I'm wondering what, like Wendy had mentioned, what additional staff are going to be in place? You mentioned several, but we don't know what kind of staff. Are you going to have counselors, you know, to be readily available to assist children because uh, they're going to be afraid of each other, the mental stress they're going through, plus they're going to be trying to learn also. So what specifically has uh, the Education Task Force uh, have in place concerning these situations with 
possible bullying um, and neglect. Let's put it that way, because as we know, a lot of times we feel, you know, children are doing real well when they're very quiet. Well, not always, as we know, they're troubled. So can you comment on that a bit? What additional, um, I guess, uh, resources are going to be specifically in place to help the children? Thank you. Melba, thank you very much. Um, I, I want you to know there are counselors in every one of the schools and I'm gonna just uh, go to uh, another school principal, sorry to put you on the spot, but I, I think it's really important to share uh, some, of the, some of the strategies that are in place right now and, and in terms of student wellness. And uh, I wonder, uh, Robin Stotts from ECG, do you mind uh, sharing a little bit what's happening. Sure, um, I can talk a little bit about the initiatives from Emily C. General. And I'm gonna also answer the one question that was in the chat about um, asking what, what, what way are we going to be assessing students? I'll, I'll answer that in a minute. But at, at our school, and I know that the other schools have been doing a lot of things in the area of wellness, but wellness needs to start with the staff right now. So we've really been doing a concentration on supporting our staff at the school. We have a wellness committee that is implementing a number of strategies for teachers. We also implement for students Pink Shirt Day. Um, we adopted that policy last year and we um, wore pink shirts uh, uh, once a week, but now we're doing it once a month and teachers are looking at some cultural values and how can we have students doing activities where they are um, looking at strategies. So each teacher has made guidelines for working on the internet with their students. They have all kinds of strategies. We have a code of digital citizenship that teachers have shared with their students and they do have lots of policies in place for that. So it is an ongoing thing and it has continued to be an ongoing thing where teachers are continuing to work with students when it comes to bullying, whether it be online or with each other. And I'm just going to answer the one question. Um, it says there was a question about well, how are we assessing students since they've been off since last March? Well, students have not been off since last March. We as teachers and principals have provided an educational program from day one. Um, it took some process along the way, but I'd like to say that we've had some strides. We have teachers who have marks from students. We've worked with Edmo on educational platform. Right now, every child at MLEC General has an iPad in hand or some type of technology where they can connect with their teacher a couple of times a day. Every child is delivered work packages. So those work packages are sent to the home, delivered by mailbox, teachers get on the buses, they arrive and meet and greet students. So we've had a very I feel comprehensive program led by Kathleen and a lot of the principals in the in the school. So students really haven't been off, um, but that doesn't mean we've reached every home. We have had some homes that haven't participated as well in the educational platform, but we will continue to keep providing it to them. So um, I think I've, I've answered a few of those things, but the, the bullying and those kinds of situations, um, we deal with all the time in the school. And it does need to be a community, a community effort that we are all working together to decrease those incidences of bullying. Um, social media is probably the largest thing, even when we are face to face with students that principals have to deal with that carry over into the classroom. And now that um, so online learning is so prevalent, it, it continues to be one of those things that we have to deal with. 
Maybe Teresa, my co-partner, could chime in a little bit for some of the efforts of Emily C. General. She's highly involved with our student leadership initiative, and we recently invited Mark. He's coming to, to play amongst us with our student leadership group next week, and I'm told I have to freshen up my skills because he's going to be joining our online platform with students, and Teresa can talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, one of the things we really tried to do since students have been away from the building is continue to offer opportunities for connection between students and our student council and student leaders in each school have been working towards that. I know at um, different schools it looks differently, but um, we've all been putting some efforts toward students connecting with one another outside of an academic kind of setting, but in an opportunity for them to engage positively with each other. Our counselors take a role in that as well. They provide different classes and clubs. I know at some of the schools they're doing beating, they're doing um, through Zoom sessions. Uh, I know our counselors meet one-to-one -one with students at their homes outside. They do uh, uh, socially distanced or safe protocol um, sessions with students. So we do have active referrals happening still now. And when we have uh, some concerns with um, that come forward from families, that goes to our counselors too. Um, we do have at our school, we started a, a club, our student council wanted to connect with each other and they're playing among us. You might've heard this of this game and it's a, a group game together we play and um, Mark's gonna join us next week, hopefully, and uh, have a chance to hang out with some of our students. We have about 20 to 30 that show up every Wednesday and um, just an opportunity to play together and enjoy uh, positive interactions with one another. And that's a student led event. Thank you so much, uh, Kathleen, Robert, and, and Teresa. Uh, I will confirm, I, I know uh, Tammy is going to be further confirming, but I will be joining you next week and so I, I totally look forward uh, to that interaction with the students. I think it's important to, you know, look to again, and thank you, um, I, I believe, to, to Melba for raising that issue amongst, you know, mental health with our students. I think, you know, as that's an important piece of, amongst not even just students, amongst adults in ourselves uh, in making sure that we're taking care of each other. And I think that's an important piece um, as we move forward, uh, you know, through through such uh, difficult COVID times here that we've all seen. Uh, so thank you for that. And I will be joining. And I look forward to that. I do want to take a time to just uh, look over to the chat at this point in time. I know I do see counselors uh, that have their hand up. I acknowledge uh, Councillor Johnson. I'll, I'll shift to you shortly. But just before then, I do want to go over to the chat just to go really quickly. I know, again, keeping in mind, this is our first time live uh, on uh, our Facebook page of Six Nations of Grand River. Uh, so thank you to community members who, who are watching live. Uh, thank you to Robin for acknowledging and answering a uh, portion of that, the first question uh, that was posed by uh, Julie Montour. So thank you for that. Uh, but I do want to go down to uh, also acknowledging all of the questions and, and what's what's happening within the chat. Um, uh, education question from K.A. Martin. Have you looked at the COVID-19 outbreaks in the school system in Toronto and how this has resulted in community transmission? I just want to just maybe shift towards that question and have a response from Kathleen and her team on that piece. Certainly, um, yes, we've been watching, uh, you know, everywhere, you know, the the outbreaks and the concerns that we have, and 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 that you would have as community members and families. Um, that's why, you know, we've moved very slowly. Um, you know, we were originally planning to open in November. That, that wasn't going to happen because of the, the cases within the community. Um, you know, the, those, we then looked at perhaps a January opening, but realizing, okay, as we get closer and looking at, at outbreaks in other areas, um, the start after the holidays would not, we felt just wouldn't be prudent. We want to do this, but we want to do this as absolutely as safely as possible. And that's why the half week, you know, half size method is what we're going for, um, you know, and, and just to be aware, the provincial schools are not doing that. They are full size classes and they are fully open. Uh, 
and what they're put in place is masks on children. Um, that's not what we're doing. Uh, we have, yes, children will be wearing masks. There, there's plexiglass at every desk. There's, um, you know, the cohorted model, so very small numbers uh, in the classroom so that they can be distanced from one another. The additional care um, that's gone into the preparation throughout this time frame is to avoid exactly those situations you're talking about in, in the schools in Toronto. And we've already taught remote. We taught remote, like in the spring of last year, we taught remote is just an emergency. Through the fall of this year, we've taught remote and in, in much more depth. Um, and, you know, if, if there's a, we would certainly pivot to remote again at any time if safety is, um, you know, at risk or, you know, with public health guidance. Every step that we make is not, um, you know, it's not just, just um, w without all of those degrees of care. So uh, we do know that, you know, as, as Audrey says, we're stingy with our children. And uh, we, you know, we will move forward with this with, with a very, very uh, heavy step to try to do this in the way that is the safest way that is possible. And that's what we're mindful of. And, you know, if council says, nope, don't do it, leave them, leave them the way they are, then that's, that's we take that direction. Um, if, you know, the, the move toward opening is 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 one that is is very carefully undertaken, um, and you know one thing I know if the numbers within the community go right up uh, for one reason or another, that's going to affect us. We we won't be able to to move to move at the debt at that target date. We have to go by that health health advice and. You know, the health advice and the science will guide what we do. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Kathleen. Again, just really quickly, if I could just acknowledge the chat, the chat room. Uh, there's another question that is posed that I, I also see Kathleen has already responded to. Uh, again, just for conversation and happening. So is winter, a question again, so is winter break two weeks for the kids from January 18th to the 31st or just one week? And again, just to clarify on that piece, Kathleen, thank you for responding. It's one week for midwinter's break, which is from January 18th uh, through to the 22nd. And again, just to add on further to the first question, that assessments of student learning has been ongoing from every school. Um, again, so that, that, that work continues. Um, I, I also just wanna just really quickly offer uh, if there's a suggestion uh, piece to this, is is it possible to maybe do uh, a virtual walkthrough prior to like much like we're doing now as live for community if that can be an option for parents to maybe be able to have a link uh, be given and to do to really do a virtual walkthrough of the classroom and and to know exactly what the what the uh, the structure and how the classroom is going to be set up during these COVID times and the measures that will be in place. I think that's an important piece that we may and should look at to, to again, virtually walk through. And maybe even in addition to that is virtually walking through the process of a student getting onto a school bus and further to Councillor Johnson's comments of transportation. You know, I think it, it may, I, I, this is the beauty of technology. And as we're seeing it now and still conducting business, um, you know, I think that the, these might be uh, offers a suggestion to at least help alleviate some of the, the concerns of parents and at least to also stress the importance that it also comes down to the parents have a choice. It's not like we're saying that each every and I, I Kathleen, I heard this in, in, in your comments that it's not like we're saying every student because if we go to the, the goal date of February 1st, given we give the, the, in the necessary approvals. Uh, from the ECG, from council, from public health, et cetera, um, you know, that it's still ultimately parents' decision. If they still feel that they, you know, do not feel safe sending their child to school, then they still have every right to continue 
uh, the process that in which their students have been learning over COVID since this time. So I just wanted to highlight those, those key areas and maybe just shift over to Kathleen before I go over to questions for, from, from counselors to maybe then look to the suggestion of virtually walking through schools and maybe even virtually setting up what it would look like to get a student on the bus and the process and what that would look like for transportation. I, I'm going to, I just in terms of your suggestion of virtual walkthroughs, I'm going to go to um, uh, Candy Browatsky, the principal of JC Hill and Jameson, uh, just to give, give council a sense of what's been done so far in that regard, okay? Perfect, thank uh, thanks, you. Thanks uh, for your question there, uh, Chief Hill. So um, we've started that process already. Um, so this month of December, uh, through our Remind app and our Edmodo, um, and through email, uh, teachers and staff have been um, sending out little short videos and doing exactly what you're talking about is, you know, um, because for our school, Wednesday is our bus day. So we, when the buses came, we had a staff member pretend to get on the bus and where they'd sit and, and had the bus driver there. Um, to talk a little bit about that, uh, walking through the school to kind of see the signage, um, kind of uh, show our kindergarten area and what that's going to look like. Um, the, the whole washroom setup, there's, there's so many little things you have to think about um, that parents may want to know and, and the students, right, um, to get comfortable for that possible return back. Um, so we've been trying to sh uh, send out uh, videos during the month of December just to show all those things, um, as well as a classroom setup and, and their little bins that they'll have with their uh, screen protectors there at their desk and how um, the space is gonna look in their, ro their rooms with their cohorts. Um, so yeah, we're trying to think of um, several di different things um, that parents and students may wanna know um, because you're right, that visual aspect is way more than you can get when you're just reading an opening plan. <laughs> the visual is um, very helpful. And so all the schools are working towards that goal to help the students and uh, their families feel more comfortable with those visuals with little videos. So thanks very much. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Ms. Bro Ms. Browatsky, by the way, thank you. I always have to call them my former teachers, by the way. It's nice to see you. Um, again, you know, I think it's uh, uh, all great plans, you know, moving forward. And again, keeping the health and safety of our students first and foremost, right? And that's what, you know, I'm glad that our council and the, the emergency control group, you know, decided to make these. And these are tough decisions because now we then now have to, you know, make sure we have supports for our parents, you know, and all the work. So I have to acknowledge and commend all the work of all of our teachers and and, and Kathleen and her team, um, because again, this is such a difficult time to maneuver through um, and stall, all stall while making sure that our students have the best uh, learning opportunities for them. So again, just wanna make those comments. Uh, I'm gonna now then now go to Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, and you touched on a number of points that I wanted to address as well. I mean, certainly I don't wanna lose sight that it's been valiant efforts on you know, by the educators, by the staff to get the schools ready, do all the work, do all of this. So um, certainly thanks to, to all of you. I, I guess I'm, I'm just stressing that this is a difficult decision. It's a, Hello? Huge, it's a huge decision. Hello? He, he's just Tim. Mark, you're not muted. So it's a, it, it's a huge decision to make weighing the pros and cons because you know, going back to, to Robin's comments about you know all the work that's been done, that's certainly great. But if we think that kids, some kids have not fallen behind, then we're, you know, we're, we're kidding ourselves because although they've been working since March, it's been in the home and it's a different environment. It's a different structure. Uh, not all parents are teachers. Not all parents are educators. So it's a completely different system and, and homes are dealing with all sorts of different issues and different problems. And in terms of having you know, iPads or whatever they have, we have major issues here in the community with broadband, internet, um, online learning. I mean, that's why we have a connectivity and broad broadband task force that's presenting to us next because of all of those issues. So I think not losing sight of that for me is an important piece of it, but certainly making 
sure that not only students have access to mental health supports, but teachers do as well. Because bringing students, bringing little ones into the classroom, there is that unsurety about transmission, all of those things. And it's such a huge liability, uh, you know, when we deal with a global pandemic. So, and, and I'd like to hear from maybe not now, but somewhere if people want to contact me, I'd like to hear from the educators to make sure that you have the resources that you need in the classrooms. Because we know historically that our classrooms have not had the adequate resources. Um, that's that's outside of COVID time. So now that we're in COVID, making sure that everybody is comfortable and has all the resources. And if we need more, then we need to know that going forward. But at the end of the day, this is a parental choice. Whether this council says, yes, open the doors, it's a parental choice of what they want to do. And they need to have all the information so that they feel safe for their children. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that, Wendy. My apologies. I, I, it's difficult going back and forth on mute and trying to answer phone calls. I'm sure we've all been in that position. So thank you. Apologize for that. Uh, I, I want to then now go to, is there any further questions or comments from any uh, counselors? I, I do want to also acknowledge the chat room. But before I go to the chat room, I want to just go to any counselors that may have any questions or comments at this time. Okay, seeing or hearing none then, I do have a, a question uh, from our comms team from online uh, and it reads, so what happens when the schools open and kids are back in, the numbers go up and the reserves and the reserve do schools close back down and then go back to paper or online learning? I, I don't know if that's necessarily, uh, I think I might maybe a two part response, but maybe Kathleen, if you want to begin on that, I think we could also have a response uh, from our, our part as the emergency control group in that piece. Okay, um, if, excuse me, if there's a situation where the schools need to need to close down because of the numbers or, or one school or uh, one classroom, that's going to be um, part of the outbreak protocol with public health. Um, if that's the case, those classrooms or that school or would, would definitely re go remote until such time as the school could um, have children back in again. Yes. So um, when we started down this path, we were we were asked to, all education facilities were asked to be able to, to put forward three models, fully remote, hybrid, and fully open. And when we started that planning way back in, uh, you know, last April, that's what we planned for. So if we need to move from one to another, um, that's what we do. But it's based on that health advice uh, at the time. And, um, I think that's that's from the school perspective, and um, she feel if you had from the emergency control group. Uh, thank you uh, again. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kathleen, for for your response. Uh, again, not speaking on behalf of the full emergency control group, as again we still have to take all, all these uh, these discussions back and have a fulsome discussion. However, I, I would see it as again going back to you know outbreak plans and Kathleen, you touched on that piece as well. In the case of, um, it's much like what's happening again. So at the ECG level as well, you know, in the case that you know we're seeing cases ri uh, rise in this, and as you've seen, also we've shifted over to the color uh, coded system. Uh, you know, that's all ultimately going to be assessed, uh, you know, during as we see, you know, if February 1st is, is the date that is, is going to be, um, you know, opening up for schools and students to go back uh, in person, um, you know, obviously we're going to be assessing the situation uh, week by week and making the necessary decisions as we see fit. Again, not speaking on full behalf of the full emergency control group, however, that's just my perspective as being a part as a member from a political position. Uh, that being said, then, are there any further questions or comments? OK, 
Chief, I have a question. Sure, go ahead, Councillor Michelle. And, and thank you everybody for presenting this evening and it's been a thorough discussion. What I want, um, Kathleen, you mentioned at the onset that you're looking for custodians but have not hired them. So is, is the opening contingent on having the full complement of staff, all the human resources? Uh, we definitely would need to have those custodians in place, yes. Okay, so we will hear that in the new year. And yeah. should you not have um, enough staff to do screening and, and all those plans that we have in place, then the schools will not, will not be opening? They, ha they have to be safe. Okay. I think, okay, uh, they have to be safe. Do we have the lead time to make that happen? Yes. And I just want to acknowledge uh, Public Works um, and, and Public Health. Uh, this is really a team effort. The educators have been absolutely wonderful um, and they've been supported every step of the way by Public Health. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't know where I would be without Lacey Venevri and Kelly Farmer both constantly working with us and supporting and advising and um, working with uh, with Michael Montour and Public Works, uh, Ken Loft, just have really, uh, everyone has just been a, a, a wonderful support for each other and trying to work this through as a team. So it's a complete team effort and collaboration every step of the way. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Michelle and Kathleen. I just want to also go back to the chat. Uh, unfortunately, one of our counselors is having some technical difficulties. Uh, Councilor Hazel Johnson uh, is posing a question, or rather even wants to hear uh, comments or opinions of our education staff. Um, she would like to hear from our education staff if they have any reservations about opening on February 1st, 2021. I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna look to our educators on that on that piece from Councillor Johnson. Is anyone willing to uh, provide their insight or feedback on that? I'll go to uh, Alex. Sure. Um, I don't have a crystal ball, you know. None of us do, and it's it's been you know you you've all raised such good questions and good concerns, and I understand them all. Um, and I can't, uh, you know, we've been making videos as well to show the parents what we're doing to keep the school safe. And uh, I can't, you know, tell a parent, I wouldn't think to uh, imagine to tell a parent, you know, send your child back to school. But what I hope to do is, you know, help them see all the things we're doing to keep things safe. Uh, I, I Yes, there's some concern, of course, you know, uh, some of us are north of 30, 40, 50, uh, <clears throat> of course, but, uh, you know, measured against that is the risk to the students and their, and their well-being. And for me personally, I think it's a fair trade. Uh, I, you know, if I can get those kids back into school uh, safely, I would like to do that. And, uh, you know, and I think we can, we can mitigate the risk by doing everything that we've been doing so far. And, and, and hopefully over the next few weeks with, as we, you know, put out more of those videos, we'll put more minds at ease about sending their children back into school. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments, Alex. Uh, are there any further comments uh, or insight or feedback to Councillor Johnson's comment? Mr. It looks like Mr. Gibson. Can you hear me? Yes, Chester. Yes. I keep dropping in and out. Um, I would just have one concern um, that if we go back, that um, the community kind of supports what the council's decisions to make. Um, I know things in the past we've um, we struggled as a community just to come together and. Uh, I don't want to feel like we're alone, I guess, uh, as a school. Um, we, need the, we need the support from the people that if we are opening up, this is the direction we're going, and that they're supportive of what we're doing. I know we did a survey in the past. I don't know, it would be kind of good to touch base with the community and uh, ensure that um, they also support our decision to go forward. 
that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gibson. Uh, are there any further uh, comments or feedback from any educators or staff on the line? Scan all. Uh, scan all. Is it Miss Miss Bombery? Oh, yes. Yeah, she's been trying to get on the Zoom. I've been getting texts that she's had struggles. It it sounds like Mrs. Riva Bombery is Riva. Can you hear us? Okay. It looks like she's on on mute. Maybe Riva, if you if you can hear us. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Now we can. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm 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 struggling with technology back here. I just want to have a few minutes to um, to express my um, have my input in this situation. Um, I support uh, the recommendation to have the students go back to school. We have spent many, I guess, hours, um, weeks, months to prepare for the students to have a safe environment. We have done everything in our power um, to ensure that should they go back, um, they're going to be in a safe environment with all the additional um, uh, social worker, uh, maintenance staff, all of the um, uh, protocol, safety protocols, we have um, spent numerous, numerous hours preparing. We have had four months of preparing our staff to, um, uh, to follow COVID um, protocol within the school. We have been practicing um, safety measures um, in order to be prepared um, to focus on students when they return. We are prepared to have the students back into the classroom. Um, and, and, and I'm confident that um, we've done as much as we can in order to get uh, where we are today. Um, Chester is right in that should we go ahead and make a decision to go forward, uh, with the recommendation of the students going back into the school. We need uh, the support of um, um, Six Nations Council, um, et cetera, in order for this to work. We understand that the environment is volatile right now, and should the environment change um, come February, then of course we would reconsider Definitely, but in the meantime, we've put measures in place for our staff safety, um, staff wellness, and student safety, uh, student uh, wellness, and we've taken into consideration all of the factors that families face within the home. For example, at IL Thomas, we have at least 200 families, and each family has a set of different circumstances, different factors that they're dealing with. There's not one family that faces similar or the same circumstance. So we are, we are dealing with a very, very um, uh, sensitive situation, and we recognize that. And as administrators going forward with Kathleen's support, direction, with public health um, support and direction, we know we have a very difficult uh, decision to make. And I'm confident that at this point in time, um, our schools are safe for our children to return. Nyawa. Uh, Riva, thank you for your comments. Uh, I want to, uh, again, still open the floor up at this time for any education staff on the line to share their input or feedback.
Okay, seeing or hearing none then, I'm gonna now acknowledge and go back just really quickly uh, to our chat. Uh, education question, uh, will our Jordan's principal workers be allowed back with our children that require them? That's a question posed uh, from community. Hi, um, I'm, I'll take that question, although any of the principals could answer it as well. Um, in terms of Jordan's principal workers, we would look at that on a case by case basis to ensure that that worker is, if that child requires the worker to be in the school with them in order to attend, then we'd have to, we would be allowed, you know, admitting that Jordan's principal worker with the child. It's very much on a case by case basis um, because, of course, we have to limit contacts. So that needs to be considered and weighed against. The needs of that individual child, um, whether the Jordan's principal worker would be good to best to come into the school with the child, or uh, be tutoring with the child in their home, uh, and so it's it's on a case by case. But the you know the quick answer to that is yes, um, that would be taken under consideration. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that response, Kathleen. I'm going, again, acknowledging the chat and uh, questions coming in from the community. I believe we may have touched on these. this next question, uh, but just if we can maybe get a, a, a re-response. Are there going to be increased janitorial services within school? Yes, uh, the, the, there will be the regular janitorial services plus COVID janitors in every school. Uh, doing constant wipe downs of, of touch points throughout the day. At no time in the day will there be will be, there be um, times when schools don't have janitors in them. Okay, so it's, it's yes. Okay, again, thank you, Kathleen, for that response. Again, acknowledging another uh, comment from our chat from community. Would our children be supplied with PPE? or can they wear their own? Also with the vaccination that could be coming, would that be mandatory for our children along with other vaccines for them to attend school? Um, so the, the PPE, uh, they can wear their masks, they can wear uh, cloth masks. Uh, however, we will have uh, masks for children as well at the school because um, you know, masks can, the, the string can break or whatever. There'll also be masks for children on the bus uh, so that no one arrives to, or, you know, gets on the bus without a mask. Um, so that's, I think that's that answer. And in terms of the vaccination, uh, would it be mandatory for children along with the vaccines for them to attend school? And that very much is a, is a public health type of question. Um, the you know what the the vaccine and the use of vaccine for schools I don't have any information at that on that at this point. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you for uh, your response to those questions, Kathleen. Just to add further uh, to the vaccine uh, portion question, uh, Councillor Nathan Wright and I uh, were on a call uh, this morning uh, with the Ontario Regional Chief and the Ontario Caucus, and we brought up that impose the actual vaccination as we see what's going to be happening by the end of month uh, with roughly almost uh, 300,000 vaccines coming into the country and obviously seeing as uh, um, Indigenous people are on that priority list. There are concerns and, and, and discussions happening at that, at that level um, regarding, you know, in the case of uh, Indigenous people more or less being the guinea pigs of this vaccine uh, you know, just basically going over those factual information on, on those pieces to it. Um, again, you know, I think it ultimately all, you know, we're advocating for best of our people, but when it comes down to that, those pieces, and again, just coming from my personal uh, perspective and opinion, that it comes down to individual choice. Um, I know I've, I've made the statement uh, I know even with parents as well, uh, like, you know, when it comes down to the flu shot, I think it ultimately comes down to the individual and what they so choose. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's been some part of the, I guess, conversation that happened this morning. Uh, the regional chief is sitting at, at the task force level 
uh, as well as the creation of a subcommittee that, that can more or less get more into the technical uh, details in regards to that table and how we can further those, uh, you know, further concerns uh, from even our emergency control group, as well as our health director and public health so that we can, again, further ask and pose these questions and, and receive uh, direct responses. Just really quickly, if I can, uh, just go to Councillor Wright. Uh, if you have anything further that you'd like to add from this morning's meeting just on the vaccination piece. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chief. And I think it's going to be important for uh, the rollout that we have that uh, real-time information. And, and I'm glad you did your advocacy around the subcommittee because I think that's going to be important for us to, uh, to be a part of so that we get that real-time information and then we're able to put it into uh, our own Six Nations um, public health uh, for them to be able to disseminate and make their plan. So uh, I know ECG has been doing our planning uh, around vaccination distribution, uh, but now we have to match up and, and uh, with what's being rolled out at the provincial level. So, um, and, and just so you know, Chief, I, I did add it to the agenda, so we'll have uh, more wholesome uh, conversations. Wholesome discussion. Yeah. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you for that, uh, Councillor uh, Nathan. Thank you. Okay, I'll just shift over just before I go to Councillor Sherry Lynn. I just want to also acknowledge uh, Councillor Johnson's comment as well as uh, she put in the chat. I believe that there's an age limit of 17 years, question mark, in terms of the vaccination piece with children. So just want to make that point and thank you to Councillor Johnson for that. I'll now shift over to Councillor Sherry Lynn. Um, I'm on, I'm thinking on the same lines as Chester. I would like the parents given the info and their feedback with the survey or what, or how they feel, because I want to hear from them before I be able, before I'm able to make that the decision because they need to, to speak what their thoughts are. And yes, I know it's their choice, but I still think it, they need a voice too. So I would like a survey. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Sherry Lynn. So I just want to go back to that point in terms of if we can maybe look to the now next steps from this point on. Uh, Kathleen, uh, obviously you, you, you've you heard uh, from Councillor Sherry Lynn in terms of further outreach to the steps that we, we want to take in terms of uh, the February 1st date. Um, and I, I, I agree as well. I think, you know, Again, I want to commend and look to the work of, of Kathleen, your team, the educators, principals, the staff, because to be honest, it truly has been a team effort uh, to be able to come to the decisions thus far. You know, it's been really difficult decisions. We know it's been huge impacts on, you know, families and, and you know, having two working parents and so forth. And, you know, there's been multiple issues in technology and, and, and broadband and connectivity all of those areas. And so, you know, these decisions have, have been very, very hard decisions. And I think, you know, uh, I, by what we're doing uh, to make sure we're having that full due diligence done to make the best informed decision on behalf of our children and students is exactly, I believe, the work that we've been doing thus far. But going back to Sherry Lynn's point of, you know, can we then do another survey with parents to further engage on this date and then perhaps come back at the next general council to make a further decision after uh, again looking to time frames and I know there's time sensitivity around that piece uh, but is that possible Kathleen? So um, you know anything's possible so if we um, put out that as a survey question um, just to um, because from our last survey we did have parental feedback that over 50% of the parents would send their children to school um, with a January start. So um, we want to, if we, if we take a general survey question uh, around a February 1st start, um, and then, because of course, then we need to get to very specific student by student information um, very soon, which we can't get from a regular sort of general survey. Um, we could put that survey question out. When is the next general council meeting? Um, 
22nd. December 22nd. You're muted, Mark. Yeah. So 22nd. So that would all. Oh, so sorry. Sorry. It's okay. Yes. That, that would already be. Um, all staff would be off by then, and student and families, right, for the for the uh, Christmas break. Eight. Uh, right. Which eighteenth starts? Um, I guess it makes it challenging to not know about February before we leave for the December break. Would it would it be possible to uh, I, I like for for council's sake, like we can call a special council meeting specifically for this topic. So I'm thinking maybe like I just I'm trying to find the the happy medium and the balance to this. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to then like for Sherry Lynn's comments to then further extend even I obviously I, I know time is obviously of the essence, um, but would it be then say if we do a special council meeting the Friday before so the 18th so that would be your actual last day for staff correct. I'm yes it would be. Yes, it would be. And, okay. uh, and just in terms of, you know, the, the uncertainty, mental health, and so on, of everyone concerned, um, we could do a survey uh, with, you know, basically one question in it. Um, the target date, do you agree, or something of that, or would you agree to a target date of opening of February 1st? Um, yes or no, you know, again, with the hybrid model a one question survey um i'm just looking at teresa davis davis vice principal of bcg I, I i count on her for her technical skills and survey but um i've already started I, drafting the survey I knew you're talking. Survey. <laughs> I knew it. so we could get a survey out to families um by tom tomorrow morning so that is you know, okay so we're that's wednesday uh, with, you know, a turnaround for answers, because if we get, uh, how quickly can we get that out? And we'd have, we'd have uh, the, the information back from parents um, before next Monday. Grand Erie did so that three days. They gave us three days to answer it. So gave you three days. I think it's doable. Okay, so if we, if we can do that and get responses back. Sorry, I want to just before I know, I, I am acknowledging Councillor Johnson and Councillor uh, Paulus Bombery. I'll get to you just hey. shortly, real quick. Um, oh, sorry, also Councillor Bombery, Bombery as well, Michelle. Uh, I just really want to look to next steps uh, prior to going to further comments or questions. But so, Kathleen, in the case that obviously, and, and thank you, Robin, uh, for, for your comments. So, if it's doable, then and we can have answers back by say Thursday, uh, December 17th, uh, that would give us then time for us to call a special council meeting on Friday, December 18th in the morning. Um, and then, or maybe even the day before, depending on, again, I'm just trying to work with everybody's schedules and timing, um, but maybe that might be a sufficient time to then look to Sherry Lynn's point of receiving further input and uh, engagement with parents. Um, would it be possible we could, if we have the data back um, by Monday, would it be possible to have a special council meeting like Monday afternoon? Of 100%. That would be Monday afternoon. 100%. September 14th. Yes, I think that, yes, we can do that. So if the survey, so when when would the survey then go go out or be able to go out to to parents? Tomorrow morning. Perfect. Okay. So if they're out by tomorrow morning, which is uh, the ninth, that gives parents uh, through the the ninth to what the deadline would be the fourteenth or the is that what we're saying? Yeah. Or the yes. yeah. Yes. 14th so then so then we can then call a special council meeting on the 14th in the afternoon or even if the next day is the 15th that's better whatever 
but we can definitely work around those schedules to do that and make further decisions so that again, uh, we're furthering engagement with parents and families. Okay. Um, what I think is important is that our staff are allowed to, you know, like they're, they're given the information that we won't be doing at January 4th. I think that's very important for them to have that information because that was the last date that we looked at was January 4th opening. Yeah, so that that needs to be that needs to be loud and clear and thank you for that Kathleen that the now new date is February 1st because right. we have to give and allow time for families and and uh, to prepare right to get back into routine obviously we know that's going to be you know uh, some we're already experiencing many difficulties to add yet another difficulty to get prepared and further get uh for school um but uh, so I'll, i will we'll wait on that point in terms of next steps so we have a, a, a potential plan and thank you kathleen for that piece i just want to go back to counselors that have had their hands raised i'm going to first go to counselor johnson I'm gonna shift over to Councillor Bombery and I'll go over to Councillor Paulus Bombery. So Councillor Wendy, you have the floor. Thank you. So I, I just, it, it's a bit of a deja vu for me, Kathleen, because when you originally came and presented, we talked about doing a survey and getting information out to parents and making sure that we had that input and that engagement. So um, Hopefully, you know, we, we learn from this as well, and there's parental engagement and input at the onset so that they're a part of this as well going forward. That way that will help us in making the decision, knowing that the parents have been involved in that. Um, certainly going forward, I mean, we could even make a decision in principle, but I think we need to see the written motion, at least for myself, of what's being presented so that we know exactly what we're making a decision on, rather than just, um, you know, agreeing to, to air at, at that point. So whether the meeting's Monday or whatever day it is, having that in writing so we can see exactly what it is, and it's very clear we're all on the same page with that. Um, and I did put a question in the chat, just in terms of the role of TAs. What, what is the role of TAs going forward? Will they be doing the same job in terms of supporting students or are there other expectations, cleaning services? Um, what's happening with that? Yeah, the roles of TAs are varied. They will be helping students, yes. Um, they will be supporting the um, the, the other COVID measures um, as well throughout the day. So uh, everyone will be involved in, in ensuring that the student um, measures are, you know, it's, so, it's, so everyone has safety responsibilities in, the, in, in part as part of their day, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wendy and Kathleen. Uh, just uh, on your first portion of your qu uh, comments, Wendy, uh, so that's the goal uh, is to, by time or finish this, this discussion, uh, the goal is to, that we're all on the same page uh, and just what you've alluded to and that so we know come Monday or Tuesday that the special council meeting will be then and a decision further will be made and that way we're making concrete decisions so that we have proper communication to our families and students uh, and parents moving forward. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that piece uh, afterwards. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna now shift over to Councillor Bombery. Thanks Chief. And so two comments. Um, so in respects to the responses to the surveys, you indicated there was a 50% response rate. So I'm assuming of they were in favor of going of those who returned the survey, correct? So did we get the majority of families participating in that? So moving forward, I would hope we engage families um, very similar to what Councillor Johnson has indicated. My second question I wanna pick up on is Reva's comments. So I apologize, I didn't, I didn't ask this early. Reva, you indicated that uh, the school's been practicing safety protocol. So I, I mean, I ask this to you and, and your colleagues, what have those, what has the staff been doing with respects to the safety protocols to date in the school because you are all attending in person at school?
Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Yes, I, I believe uh, Riva is having some, I can see her. I can see her, her lips moving, <laughs> but I can't hear her. And then I pose Riva, a question to all administration and educators on the line. So maybe if, if we can, Riva, if you, I, I know you're experiencing some technical difficulties, maybe if you want to uh, utilize the chat to respond to that. And if there are any educators or education staff who can maybe assist Riva in, in uh, Councillor Bombery's uh, question. Ms. Okay. Um, I, I, yeah, I can go ahead <laughs> while Reva's. Um, so we've been uh, following all the safety protocols. So um, we have, we stay in our space. <laughs> uh, we keep our two meters distance. Um, we uh, monitor our own um, health and we have a daily uh, check, uh, screening that we do. Um, and we wash our hands. We have um, Zoom meetings instead of in-face meetings. Um, we have our hand sanitizer all around. Uh, the custodians are coming around and um, washing doorknobs and, and doors that uh, we enter and exit. Um, we're doing lots of um, different things um, and practicing uh, those while we work in the building. And uh, we try to get outside for some um, outdoor uh, activities um, so that we can still kind of, um, with our own mental health, have our circle outdoors and uh, keep our two meter distance and have our mask, but um, um, some, have some uh, guest time together uh, outside. Um, and people are going for walks um, as well um, during their own uh, break times. Um, I don't, I don't know if that helps answer the question. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Ms. Borowski. I'm going to just now shift over to back to see uh, um, Riva, Ms. Bomber, are you able to, can you hear us okay? Are you? Okay, uh, she still unfortunately is uh, dealing with some some technical difficulties. Riva, if you'd like to maybe, again, just if you can uh, maybe type your response. Um, but while, while maybe we do that, I'm going to shift over uh, to Councillor Paulus Bombery. Councillor Audrey. Yeah, hello, everybody. I just wanted to add to uh, Kathleen your, your survey and just ask the question, are you going to do a small preamble at the beginning of it where you're going to update the parents on the school nurses, the custodians, uh, more staff, and the safety protocols that, that will be in the schools? to help them make their informed decision if you already haven't done this. And I would also just like to finish with that. I'd like to congratulate, congratulate Kathleen and all the staff, administrators, everybody in the schools and the parents and the students in these COVID times. It's, it's gotta be really hard having a little kindergarten sit, sit down and pay attention for longer than two or three minutes. And uh, uh, I take my hat off to you. And you've thought of a lot of the safety stuff. And um, again, the decision will be made. It'll be a, a decision of the parents where they go. Even after all of this stuff is done and, you know, 60% could say they want to go back. It's still going to be a parent, parent choice. And we respect that. that. Nyawa. Nyawa, Audrey, for your comments. Uh, okay, I want to shift now into just uh, recognizing also uh, the time. Uh, again, it's been a very uh, fulsome uh, uh, dialogue and discussion. Obviously, the, the utmost care and safety and health and safety of our students is, is paramount and at the forefront. Um, and so I just want to look to now next steps. Uh, again, if we can, I know we, we got a little bit into uh, next steps. Again, acknowledging Councillor Sherry Lynn's uh, concerns and comments uh, of reaching out to parents on this date. Um, so I want to just now shift over to Kathleen uh, and Teresa, if I can, if, if uh, a survey can be out with the, you know, very uh, simple form, one question type, that seems to be the, the issue at hand, uh, to receive feedback from parents and families, uh, to then further our uh, 
decision to again make a best informed decision on behalf of our, our families and students. Uh, so I can look to either again if we can clarify which date. I know our schedules are, are quite crazy during these times as well. Uh, however, uh, we can schedule again giving the priority of this issue uh, either a special council meeting on Monday or Tuesday. I will look to again clear anything that I have. Again, I don't think it should take up too much time. Um, however, we'll go over the results of the survey um, and establish that date. So I'm just going to look over to Kathleen on that piece, whether which date works best for a special council meeting and uh, the turnaround to get that. I know Teresa had commented that a survey can be out as early as tomorrow morning. Um, again, acknowledging the good work uh, of, of each of uh, the educators on the line and their staff and Kathleen and your team again. Uh, but I just want to shift over to next steps in, in how we can uh, move in the, in the best way forward. Kathleen? So really, it's ask, uh, we're asking two questions. One, that, that, stu that the back to school for students does not start January 4th and that the target date of February 1st is established. And um, looks like the putting, a, taking another survey around the February 1st date would give the information that council needs to support that decision. Is that correct? So I think there's basically two decisions yes. happening. Okay. The decision of not yeah. open January 4th is very important for our staff to know. It, sooner, it, you know, that, that's one that um, cannot so be known. I just, 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 just on that piece, Kathleen, I think, I, just from my perspective, and I'm looking to my colleagues on council, I think we can make that decision tonight. Uh, it seems that we can make, you know, uh, by by virtue of the conversation, um, I think that we we could be able to make that decision so that again our educators are are, are aware that that is now uh, not the effective date that we're looking at. Uh, in the, in addition to the next step, uh, then would be to look to the survey of the February first, the new goal date uh, of opening again pending uh, ECG public health in Six Nations, the Grand River Elected Council decision, um, that February 1st would now be then the goal date. So I'm gonna look to Councillor Audrey has her hand up. Is it for a motion? Yes. For that first is, one. Okay, so the motion is uh, that Councillor Audrey is moving on, is that we would not uh, be opening on the January 4th date. I believe that's that correct date. Uh, I'm looking then now to a seconder to that motion. Is there a um, second call for a seconder to Councillor Audrey's motion of not opening on the January 4th date? I'll second, Sherry Lynn. Second by Councillor Sherry Lynn, thank you. Is there any further questions or comments from council to the motion? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Favor. Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Motion to waive second reading. Moved by Councillor Audrey, seconder. I'll second, I'll second Sherry Lynn. Second, second by Councillor Sherry Lynn. Are there any further questions or comments? If not, all in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Okay, thank you uh, for that council. Kathleen, that solves the first portion. Uh, now the second piece will then go to uh, the uh, uh, getting all on the same page. So having a survey out for those uh, for the date, the new goal date to parents. And then now looking to, I just want to clarify either Monday or Tuesday for a special council meeting 
to then have further decision made to that date. Keeping in mind the results of the survey from parents and families, uh, as well as further approval from the ECG Public Health and full council. I see Councilor Johnson has her hand up. Wendy? And if from, I guess from my perspective, there's no more, that, there's nothing else that we can do tonight. Um, we can't make a motion for them to do a survey if that's what ISC decides to do, then that's up to them, but we can commit to having the meeting and, and that's it. Yes. And yeah, uh, th thank you for that. Thank you for that, Wendy. I wasn't necessarily looking for a motion per se. However, I was just looking to make sure we're all on the same page to the next steps. Is there any questions or comments to those next steps? Can we just discuss what the survey is going to be? The question that's going to be asked to parents? I think that's important. Sure. Thank you for that, Robin. Uh, I want to then now open up that conversation uh, to see, I want to, even if I can go to Kathleen or if, as well as Councillor Sherry Lynn, uh, if you have anything in particular uh, that you would like to see specifically within the survey. Um, Sherry Lynn, um, no, I just wanted to know if they, they agree or don't agree, um, the comments they do have from the information that's been given, what more would they like seeing, those kinds of things their input on, on um, the opening. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sherry Lynn. I wanna shift over to maybe Kathleen. Okay, so we have some uh, question suggestions at this point. Um, given the current plans to reopen schools using a cohort model, small class sizes, student attend attendance, um, based <laughs> inclusion of daily outdoor learning. We, we give a preamble of what it would look like. Uh, would you support a February 1st opening date for the schools? So I think that, I, that, that to me, again, just my personal perspective, it's, it's clear, it's concise, it's to the point. I don't think we, we don't, we don't want to overload too much. Uh, you know, we want to really get to the, to the, to really the, how they feel on the opening date. I think that's the priority at this at this time, but I, I do want to uh, shift over to Councillor Wendy. Has her hand up? Yeah, I, I just think we've had a lot of good discussion. We've provided a lot of our opinions and perspectives and, and trying to make sure that the community is included in, in the process. So rather than get into what the questions are, because I think that's getting into the administration of this, and, and I would count on the experts, the educators, to come up with those survey questions and how they want to engage the parents. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Wendy. Uh, so then uh, just based on, on, on those comments and again, the conversation, uh, I will, I, I also agree with Wendy. Uh, you know, we're, we are a little bit getting into the administrative, so I'm gonna again rely back onto the team uh, to look to those pieces of the survey. We will then as leadership in the governance lane, uh, look to the results and to make that best informed decision. I do, however, just wanna bring up one uh, piece uh, Monday or Tuesday. Kathleen, looking to you on that piece. Um, if you call a meeting, I will be there. So, so the 14th okay. and 15th, because yeah, a, a lot of planning rests on this. So, um, however, however it can work for council, day or night, either day. Okay. That, uh, that being said, then I, I, I'm just going to make a call at this point in time. Uh, and, and, and say the 15th, if we can, Tuesday, Tuesday morning, uh, we'll look to, uh, I will be calling a special council meeting specifically on this issue. Okay. Okay, and that being said, then are there any further questions or comments? If not, I, I again wanna thank, uh, thank you, Kathleen, oh, sorry. Uh, Councillor Audrey, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, can it be at like nine o'clock in the morning because I have an appointment at ten o'clock in the morning with uh, on, on an education matter? Yeah, that that that's that's the goal that I was also setting is for nine a.m. Tuesday Thank morning. 
Okay, thank you for that, Audrey. Again, I uh, just want to say thank you, and Yawa, Kathleen, to all of uh, your team, to all of our principals and teachers and staff, students, families. It's such a difficult time uh, during uh, COVID times. Uh, but again, you know, we're all in this together, and it's 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 thoroughly refreshing and appreciative to see the collaborative work uh, that's being done to again protect the health and safety of all of our students. So again, now for all, all of your work, and we'll look to Tuesday, uh, December fifteenth at nine a.m. to reconvene on further decisions uh, for the new goal date. Okay, that thank being said, then again, thank you, Kathleen, for joining us this evening. Uh, we'll thank look you, at the next steps on Tuesday. Yeah, thank you very much for your Ona. time. And thank you all of the educators. On everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank Ona, you. Everybody. Have a good evening. You're more than welcome to stay, by the way. This is, again, our first, <laughs> our first live session uh, via Facebook involving our community and making sure again, you know, our goal as, as the 58th is communication, transparency, accountability. Um, and I think we're achieving that goal by making this live for community to join in on the discussion. So again, you're more than welcome to stay educators. <laughs> uh, that being said, then uh, I'll now shift into our next delegation, uh, which is the connectivity and broadband task force. Uh, speaking on behalf of, I'm looking to our SEO, Darren Jameson, uh, as well as Linda Parker and Matt Jameson. I believe they're all on the line. Uh, I just want to shift over to maybe, uh, if I can, uh, pass the floor to our SEO to then maybe introduce uh, this, the, the issue and subject, and, and then we'll go from there. Thanks, Chief. Um, first of all, I just wanted to start with... Uh, this will be a verbal update and and i do look to um the the favor of council if they would like to have a more fulsome report on the 21st and the reason i reason i'm suggesting that is we are we are for, in the formative stages we we've had three meetings of the core team of the core the, the cbtf the, the connectivity broadband task force as well as we just had our our wider advisory group meeting on friday which which was actually quite well uh well attended we had uh over 20 participants uh, from, from other jurisdictions, uh, some companies, uh, we had CKRZ involved, we had Norfolk County, uh, Brant, Brantford, uh, really good participation on the call. And I think it was um, good in terms of a communication uh, component of the task force and its, and its mandate to look at connectivity solutions for Six Nations. So as part of the uh, verbal update, I'll, I will kind of give you an idea of what, what's been happening so far and, and what we're looking for. Um, we are looking uh, specifically towards uh, the Universal Broadband Fund application, which is uh, deadline is February the 15th. Uh, and uh, that carries at a 90% fund uh, for economy uh, expenses. And in order to, to get some traction and, and technical support for the application, we are poised, and actually we're going to do that probably tomorrow, is to release an expression of interest to uh, not only the, the uptakers for the SWIFT program, inc inclusive of all, not, not, uh, not specific to, I know we are working with Explorant on a tower solution as an interim measure, but there, there's a fifth, I think a 12, 12 uptakers that apply to that, including Bell and Rogers, and some of the big players. So we're submitting the expression of interest to those folks uh, because the, some of the conditions around the universal broadband application is that it's open access. So it's, it's not only that we look at the putting in a, uh, the backbone through the center uh, sections of, of the community, our community, but we it's open access to other providers. So it, what it does is it provides a competitive environment going forward. So I think that's also very key in terms of cost of service for our, for our citizens. So that's a really key component of that. Uh, but we, and where we lack on, on the technical side, uh, that's where we want to bring in a partner uh, to help us develop that, that application. And uh, that could be multiple partners as well. So we foresee, and I know Chief, you've been involved um, when can with the task force, and it's very much appreciated in terms of the solution is a, a Six Nations solution. Uh, and, and it's not serving the big companies and their profits, but it's looking at because of our, our challenges here with trees, tree cover and, and topography and, and you know all of those issues that we face, there's a lot of interference of signals and so on. 
uh, we're looking at a, a hybrid model of, of Wi-Fi, satellite, and fiber. So we're, we're, we'll be looking to, um, I guess, assess those, those um, submissions through the expression of interest versus a, versus a full RFP, because once we have that, then we can evaluate who's, our, who's gonna be our best technical partner for the application. It still leaves it open for open access going forward. So that's kind of our, our, our position right now. Um, part of our challenge has been um, to get some administrative support. So we're looking to, to also uh, bring that in uh, on, on a part-time basis to, to, to assist the task force and making sure that we're, we're pleased to have that application ready. So we have a tight timeline, uh, but we have some good people, not only on the core team, but not with our, our, our wider advisory group. So maybe I'll just pause there. And I know, I don't think Linda's on the call, but she may be, Matt, Matt's here. Um, I don't know whether there's anything more uh, that those those members would like to add uh, before before we open it up for any questions, but just just to put the point on that that we would be uh, in a position to provide a more fulsome uh, an actual written report update to council on the twenty first. So Matt, if you have anything more to add, no, I don't think so, Darren. I think it's uh, you, you wrapped it up nicely. We're just really getting organized and the outreach. I think is coming together, and it's all about a Six Nations led solution which I think is uh, the main focal point of the team. Good. And, uh, you know, just, just to give you a sense of, uh, I kind of mentioned some of the advisory group. We've got, you know, the M Toby Barrett, you know, MP. Uh, we've got MPP from Brandt. Um, you know, we've got some of our own directors involved, some business partners. Um, you know, Grand River Insurance is an example. We got the Language Commission as part of our group as a business. Uh, you know, we've obviously we've got our core team, which is uh, is Linda Parker is a real key key resource for us uh, on that team because she's got an extensive background in, in uh, information technology as well. And uh, we had invited Di Diane Finley and, and some other politicians to also participate. They were unable to, to attend. Um, they sent their regrets, but uh, part parcel of this as well as we're looking at letters of support from. Most parties, they've indicated that they will provide a letter of support for application, which is also a key component to a successful uh, application, particularly to the universal broadband. There's also an Ontario fund, uh, the in, in, uh, internet uh, connectivity uh, for, for Ontario. It's, it's, it's also coming up very quickly in January. So we're trying to also, and that's actually more of a phased approach. So we don't have to have a full proposal in place for that, it's an intent stage. So we're also looking at that uh, coming up very soon as well. So we have a lot of activity and I think we've done a, a great job in pulling what we can from, from the, uh, you know, our, our advisory members as well. Uh, and their support was, was, I think, bar none, I think everyone was willing to support our application. So I'll, I'll stop there, Chief. Um, I don't know if you have any more to as well. Um, we've had three meetings of the task force and, and we just had a broader advisory just on Friday. So we're going to meeting meeting what at least at least weekly until we're we're ready for these to submit the application. Thank you, uh, thank you, Darren, uh, for for that. Again, just uh, just want to also again uh, commend the the work. I know that we're we're ultimately it seems uh, fighting against uh, the clock at these times with the applications. And the first ones I believe in January, and the second one I think is in February. Uh, so again, a lot of committed. Uh, community members and, and again making sure that we're inclusive uh, to everybody because again if this is for uh, ultimately for the benefit of, of our entire community so again appreciative of, of the membership and, and the work that's being done in that uh, regard. I want to just also just shift to uh, the chat room again acknowledging the chat and community uh, there's an internet uh, comment more or less uh, it's, it states I'm okay with it as long as it's not 5G <laughs> so I'm wondering if, if, if we can, uh, if we can maybe look to, I know the community sessions have been in play uh, and I'm not sure in terms of, I, I tried to get to the last one, fortunately was unable to get to that piece or to that event, but I'm wondering if there's maybe some comments that we can be, that can be made in regards, because that seems to be, uh, you know, what I've seen uh, floating around in, in community is, is the concern around 5G. So I'm, Wondering if, if, if any of our members, Darren or Matt or uh, anyone on the line can maybe at least start to allude to the fact around the fear or concern around 5G. 
Yeah, I can, I'll pass it to Matt, but I, I had the same concerns. Uh, I, I've read a lot of, um, I've done my own research around that in terms of the frequency and what it does to your cellular, uh, how your cells respond to uh, in your body. Um, so there is sort of both pro and con with 5G, but I know that exploring it in terms of those in, inter, those sessions that you, that you refer to, Chief, um, they did address that question. And um, I think that Matt maybe can provide a little more insight into that. I'm, I don't want to put you on the spot, Max. I know it's more of a technical question, but uh, I know that it was, it was addressed in, in, in one of the, the sessions. So uh, sure, um, if you can add any more to that. Yeah, I'll try. So uh, the towers themselves are being deployed with 4G technology, but they're, they're being characterized as quote unquote 5G ready. We've spoken with Explornet about what that means. And uh, you know, right now the plan is not 5G, but it's not ready for 5G. And before we advance into the 5G spectrum, uh, we, would, we would likely go back out of the community to update them in terms of what that means. Uh, in addition to that, the, the height of the towers themselves uh, create uh, a, bit, a, a buffer zone, if you will, from exposure to 5G. And so it's, Based on, I think it's called uh, Code 6, there's an actual uh, uh, federal government regulation called Code 6 around 5G placements, which requires uh, 5G technology to place a certain height off the ground, and I don't know what it is. I'd have to refer to Code 6 to, to find out. But effectively, what I've been told is that at the, at the height of the tower placement for the technology at 4G and then potentially at 5G in the future, we've eliminated the exposure to any of the 5G risks. But we're not even in a 5G scenario yet anyways. It's 5G ready, but rolling out 4G. That's my understanding. I know there is a, uh, a frequently asked questions uh, piece on the website, which we update every Friday. And I think that there is a, a very, very detailed uh, answer to that question on, on the frequently asked questions. I just don't know it off the top of my head. Very cool, a very technical answer, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate that your your comment, uh, your comments as well, Matt and Darren. I, I apologize. I, don't, I also didn't mean to put you on the spot. I know there's more of a technical background to that piece and can uh, further uh, uh, look to further explanation on that. Uh, again, just want to go back to the chat and acknowledge uh, a question. Uh, again, might be posed through the the sessions. Why such expensive internet? Uh, ExploreNet is the most expensive and does not have unlimited opportunity. Why this company? Well, I I'm gonna shift over to- <laughs> Maybe I can ask Matt to answer that. He's, he's, he's our business guy. I think it's a temporary solution. I'll just say that for now. That's why we're doing the connectivity with the fiber. And one of our conditions sure, for the sure. EOI is cost of service is, is a, a, one of the, the framework for that. So go ahead, Matt. Yeah, okay, so uh, why ExploreNet? Well, we're dealing with ExploreNet because ExploreNet acquired Silo Wireless. So Silo Wireless was the incumbent wireless provider that we were dealing with on our internet towers. We had a contract with them. The balance of that contract was eight more years. So when they were acquired by ExploreNet, um, ExploreNet acquired their rights to the tower. And you know, admittedly, I think ExploreNet would admit that it hasn't been an, a smooth transition from Silo to ExploreNet. Some service issues I know were encountered issues around tax cards and things of that nature. I know Explornet is working hard to resolve those issues. They are uh, looking forward to this new technology because what it will do is it will, uh, you know, as part of the communications, take community coverage from 68% to 98%, which is good. But they also have, uh, as part of their platform, a an unlimited um, bandwidth uh, option for for subscribers. And they also have unlimited number of users in the household. So if you look at uh, other, other service providers like Bell or something, they might limit your, or Rogers, they might limit you to five uh, devices in your home. The ExploreNet platform does not do that. However, it is constricted based on the bandwidth that you have. So if you have 20, 20 devices operating, or, you know, your performance will diminish. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, if I can interrupt just really quickly, Matt, I apologize. Uh, I see uh, everyone on the screen is on mute except Councillor Hazel Johnson, and we're really receiving feedback. It's uh, Councillor Hazel and Councillor Kerry. If I can ask if you guys can please uh, put yourselves on mute uh, because we're receiving a lot of feedback and it's difficult to hear. 
Uh, so just want to make that note. If you can, please, Councillor Kerry, as well as Councillor Hazel Johnson, uh, to put yourselves on mute uh, so that we could further hear uh, Matt in his response. My apologies, Matt, for interrupting. Go ahead. You have the floor again. Yeah, so no, I was so just to conclude, uh, my understanding is it's Florida has a package that they roll out, which is unlimited, um, which is an unlimited package. And so the, the, the Explornet of the past is an old satellite system, which is they're, they're actively migrating the customers away from that. I used to be an Explornet customer under the satellite system. It was restricted. It was frustrating because you'd get capped at the amount of uh, data you could use. This new platform they're moving forward uh, will eliminate that limitation. And more importantly, the new technology on the towers will provide enhanced service and the ability to be more reliable and um, and uh, penetrate the tree covers that we have here better. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Matt. Again, apologize for uh, experiencing a little bit of feedback, trying to make sure we we have the best uh, moving forward here. Uh, I do want to acknowledge uh, Councillor Wendy has her hand up. Questions or comments? Just a really quick question. Just uh, Darren, was there any result of the proposal that we supported? We wrote the terms of reference. There was a, a quite a quick turnaround for that. Was there an outcome to that? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we understand we'll, we'll get notification on those applications. Could be any day now. Um, so. As soon as we hear, we'll 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 share the news. Yeah. Mark. Also, just a quick point before I go to Councillor Carey for question or comment on on that point, uh, Wendy. I also have a meeting. I believe it's on Thursday uh, in regards to the Swift application. Uh, so that will even be further follow up to to your question. Um, Councillor Carey, you have the floor. Yeah. Matt, uh, for the existing towers, are you going to upgrade the equipment that's on them for um, ExplorNet? So the existing towers that we have are being replaced, carry with all new towers. So we'll have six new towers. And for the three towers that we have existing, we will have effectively a twin tower arrangement with both of them standing beside each other for a period of time. The old towers will be there for up to two years, believe it or not, because the migration of customers may take that long. The towers, the old towers are actually council property. I think the question then pivots to what is the potential use for those old towers? You know, we've kicked around the idea, you know, could they be used for emergency services? Could they be used potentially to augment the cellular service in our community, which we know is not great. I think that sort of ties into the discussion around the task force around how do we how do we find the best, um, you know, most cohesive solution that maximizes, you know, connectivity in our community? And I think that those old towers could provide value um, in that way. But there is no decision on the old towers yet. And we'll, we'll likely, well, we will come back to council to see what the costs might be of retrofitting them for the purposes of cellular or other, or other purposes. Yeah, no, I was just wondering because you you mentioned like a sixty percent. And then with the new ones going up, that increases it to 95%. So I just thought if you were gonna take any of the old ones down, wouldn't that reduce the coverage? No, uh, we, don't, we don't believe so. In fact, the, the new towers will be shorter towers, uh, but because of the technologies, new technologies that they're gonna deploy, even the shorter towers have a, a better ability to reach the home, the households that we are targeting. And, you know, we've also added two new towers uh, into the mix, uh, one at the, uh, the great building on Cheesewood Road and one at the, um, our sustenance building up on the fourth line. And so those two new towers are there strategically to provide coverage that doesn't exist today. Yeah, I was just thinking around where I live, there's so many trees and like, like we have a hard time with, with like even, even this Zoom meeting we're having, a, we have a hard time. And hopefully with that one at the fourth line, the sustenance uh, location that might, that might increase. Okay, that's all I want to know. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Uh, are there any uh, further questions or comments uh, for Darren or Matt? Okay, seeing or hearing none then, I think at this point in time, uh, we can maybe just accept this as, uh, as information, a verbal update uh, from the connectivity task force. Is there a motion to that effect? I'll move. Moved by Carrie, seconder. Second by Audrey. Uh, are there any further questions or comments? Yeah, Chief, I just wanted to quickly say that, you know, there, there's some really good integration you know, uh, in terms of my, my, my participation as, as a chair of this task force, but also our emergency planning committee. Um, the, the point that Matt raised about, uh, you know, using those towers for other uses. I think all of this is a COVID response and it's an emergency planning response. Uh, you know, obviously we talked about that at length with education, I think it was a very good discussion and it just puts a point of another point on our ability as a community to respond and prepare ourselves for future issues that go come forward. COVID is just one, you know, of potentially others that that may may come down the road. And you know, if we build our infrastructure and, and with that in mind, uh, I think there's good integration. There's there's good synergies, uh, and we look at the best use of the assets we have. You know, and and ensuring those assets, as you know, Chief, we're talking about that too. Yes. Yes. Agreed. And I, I, I agree with you very much. So Darren, I think also to just a quick little comment. Uh, I, you know, I had the opportunity in the office uh, just to uh, see our director uh, of our IT, Dave George, you know, and he's, he's beyond thankful to see this work happen. Uh, because, you know, recognizing the importance uh, behind the IT and what it does for our organization and as well as a community at large, in particular to this issue. You know, I, again, it's, it's, again, he is grateful for the support and to see that, uh, you know, these, these uh, IT issues and concerns be addressed and further looked into. So just wanted to make that comment as well. A lot of good work happening. Appreciate that. Okay, is there any further questions or comments uh, to the motion? Okay, if not, then it's been moved and seconded all in favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Again, uh, just wanna thank you, Matt. Uh, Linda, I'm not sure if Linda's on the line or not, but thank you, Matt, uh, for joining us this evening, as well as Darren uh, for, for helping provide that update uh, this evening. Uh, we'll now shift in council uh, to our next uh, item and we're under the delegation portion. Uh, which is, uh, again is the federal legislation on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Again, want to acknowledge Councillor Wright uh, in his work and, and bringing this issue forward. Uh, uh, also, as well as our team, uh, Dwayne and Darren, again on this issue. Uh, so right away, what I'll do there is a briefing note prepared within your Dropbox Council. Um, so I will at this time maybe shift over to Councillor Wright. Uh, and as well as uh, Dwayne, uh, just to further uh, have a background on the briefing note that's been prepared. Thanks, Chief. I'll, um, I'll quickly just do a quick overview and then turn it over to Dwayne for a little bit more specifics. But essentially what we're talking about is uh, Bill C-15. Um, and this bill has been introduced, I believe it was on December 4th for first reading in, in the House of, uh, or in the Parliament. And um, virtually what we're looking to do is, is look at ways that, um, you know, this bill's going down and the intention is to have it passed by the end of 2020. Um, and so essentially that means uh, the date of December 21st becomes um, really important because this bill uh, within the next, um, you know, two weeks is looking to pass to Royal Assent. And I just want to give a, a quick highlight of what Bill C-15 does. It, it provides and creates a framework really um, for the implementation of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. But what we have found and what maybe Duane can talk about a little bit more is it leaves more questions than answers. Um, 
And really, virtually all of the details and the real legal impacts will be addressed in subsequent plans, reports, and the legislation coming after. So the first thing that this particular bill does is it triggers the need for um, Canada now to update all of their pieces of legislation uh, to come in line with the declaration. And at first blush, we, we look at that and seeing that as a positive, uh, but at the same time, we want to ensure that, you know, the rights and protections around Section 35 still uh, are in place until such time that we get out of the Indian Act. Um, so that's piece one is all of those pieces in terms of, you know, that's an enormous amount of work for Canada to undertake to, to overhaul their legislative pieces. And therein lines another question as it relates to, um, you know, projects um, <clears throat> and, and natural resource projects and, and whether or not Canada is going to update their um, duty to consult um, laws uh, to conform with uh, FPIC, which is the, uh, the uh, free prior and informed consent piece, which is in the declaration. So those are the questions that we're looking to get answered. And um, maybe what I'll do is at this time, I'll turn it over to, to Duane to give some specifics around it. And then my suggestion around next steps is, is to continue monitoring this and, and send a note to uh, the Department of Justice uh, Minister, uh, Minister Lametti, to highlight some of these concerns going forward. Because ultimately, a lot of this work is going to, you know, create high expectations for First Nations going forward, but at the same time, it has long lasting impacts. So I think we need to ensure that we get it right the first time, uh, that we do the hard work uh, to ensure that uh, we're protected going forward, uh, and uh, that we let folks know that, you know, we're not looking to rush into this uh, by any means, so the timeframes need to be uh, uh, far more respectful so that there can be participation going forward. So uh, with that, maybe I'll turn it over to Duane for a little bit more specifics on the impacts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nathan. So uh, just doing some research, uh, doing some reading on, on this particular subject. Uh, there's, as Nathan has uh, mentioned, there's, there's more questions around this uh, legislation than there is answers at this point. Um, in the attachments, uh, you'll see a recent uh, briefing note from the Chiefs of Ontario um, they've highlighted uh, a number of different concerns uh, with the legislation. Uh, they've, they've outlined some concerns in the preamble uh, around the issue of self-determination um, and uh, as well as the implementation of, of the, uh, the act. Um, there's a number of concerns that have been identified in the articles attached to the legislation. Uh, and uh, again, um, what, what seems to be at the heart of the matter currently from First Nations perspective is there's not been uh, a lot of consultation as of yet on the legislation uh, with First Nations. I don't even believe at this point uh, there has been a consultation session uh, with the uh, First Nations people in Ontario. And so, as Nathan had pointed out, um, there seems to be a rush to try and pass this legislation at this point. Um, and, and there's just a lot of unanswered questions. Um, there's a, a concern uh, in the uh, articles re regarding uh, free prior and informed consent, uh, something that uh, Nathan had uh, focused in on, and it's been raised by other uh, Indigenous groups uh, across the country. So <clears throat> um, with that being said, um, there's also questions about 
how if this uh, legislation is passed, how is it going to impact on Section 35 of the Constitution Act, where currently all of the uh, uh, Aboriginal rights are are located? Will the question is, will it supersede or will it eliminate those existing rights uh, as they uh, are written now or identified in Section 35? So, uh, uh, on space, the legislation has the potential to be strong for Indigenous people, but right now, with the lack of consultation and the questions uh, uh, that, that are out there, um, it's, uh, we're suggesting a letter of support uh, uh, to uh, the to AIAI, the uh, Iroquois uh, Association of Iroquois and Allied uh, Indians, who are taking a leading role in uh, trying to defeat the legislation. Uh, we're looking for uh, a letter uh, to support them in, in their efforts. Um, without the, uh, in, uh, the consultation that uh, we require um again if that consultation is there and and we're able to participate fully um you know things could could possibly change and, and resolve and, and it's quite possible that this could be a very uh beneficial legislation for indigenous people across uh canada so uh i'll leave it there i know uh we had uh, sort of pulled this together uh, from that action item from our political liaison, but uh, moving forward, next steps, uh, we're looking for uh, letters, uh, a letter to the Minister of Justice, as uh, Nathan had alluded to, and, and a letter of support uh, to AIAI, uh, who is taking a, a, a leading role uh, in the campaign and seeking like-minded uh, First Nations to join in the support. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Nathan and Duane, uh, for that overview. I'm now, just before going to, I, I do see that there are, and thank you, Duane, for uh, acknowledging those next steps and recommendations. Uh, but just prior to we go to those pieces, I want to open the floor up for any questions or comments. Are there any questions or comments? I see Councillor Audrey, and then I'll shift over to Councillor Wendy. Yeah, who's leading at AIAI, and um, are there any other First Nations who are are joining with them to support uh, AIAI? So, if, if I may, Chief, the, um, the AIAI passed the motion, so all uh, member First Nations are doing that. I believe they're at eight now. Um, and um, the, the Grand Chief there is Joel Abram, um, so he's the one uh, leading the charge on this. Um, in terms of additional support going forward, uh, uh, Chief and I were at the Ontario Caucus where this was also discussed this morning. Um, they are uh, playing the diplomacy role as the Ontario region and looking to strengthen a motion that's going forward, I believe, tomorrow at the Assembly. Um, and uh, a lot of amendments have gone into it. I, I looked at the first draft of it and, and uh, it was pretty atrocious, uh, but I'm being rest assured that uh, from AIA that they're working to, to get it to a place where it would be acceptable for Ontario chiefs. Uh, and you asked if there's additional Ontario chiefs. I heard uh, uh, a number of concerns this morning at the talk as it relates to this particular piece. Uh, and, and narrowing in on, on the piece about our concerns as well when it really comes to EPIC, uh, the hostility that, that this might create between Section 35 and UNDRIP, uh, as well as some of the pieces that have to be eliminated around the Doctrine of Discovery and Ontario's Null List. Those pieces would have to be eliminated, and I know uh, a number of uh, discussions are going on uh, probably right now 
to, to get those pieces um, put into that resolution. So uh, there's a lot happening real time. Um, so I just want folks to be aware. And, and I just want to underscore again the time frame. You're looking at December 21st for Royal Ascent. Um, uh, and, and that's pretty quick. Thanks, Nate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for that. Uh, I'm going to now go to uh, Wendy. Oh, thanks. And thanks, Nathan, for pulling this together and for reporting on it. It reminds me of the former FNGA. It, uh, it has the same flavor of that. And as much as we want to work to get out from under the Indian Act and, you know, and carve out what, what is good for us and here at Six Nations. Uh, I think we have to look at Section 35 as well because this has a potential to make it a contentious issue going forward. I'm just wondering with everything that's going on and certainly appreciate what AI, AI has, has shared with us, but have you had any opportunity, Mark or, or others, to talk with Dr. and Grand Chief Wilton Littlechild? I mean, this has been his life's work. So he's one of the you know paramount experts in this area. So having um, some work with him or some dialogue too to help us understand and, and position this going forward, I think would be important. Just, just if I may, uh, Nathan, just before I go to you, I just want to comment as well. Uh, again, uh, recognize for sure uh, Willie, uh, a little child and all of his work. I actually had the opportunity, I, I not specifically on this issue per se, but when I was uh, part of the, uh, the Canadian youth movement uh, and to speak at the United Nations in New York City, I had the opportunity to kind of just really shift off with little child and to kind of pick his brain on these, on these issues. And obviously we're seeing them now at the forefront and on now that we're discussing them. So, you know, for sure, definitely my office will be reaching out, but to date, I have not had any direct contact specifically on this piece. But I, I, just before I go to, uh, to Audrey, I want to just shift over to, to Councillor Nathan uh, for a response as well. Yeah, and, and back to your question, a very short conversation, I had an opportunity over the weekend to talk with him. Um, and, and he has um, not necessarily, um, I, I wouldn't, he wouldn't phrase them as concerns, um, but he does point out, and the one thing, the one tip that he did give me is that those authors of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People all those years, they felt they made it really easy on states to start implementing it this because um, the starting of the wording he, he mentioned, he said, go through it and look at it and see what says states shall. And those are the operative clauses that Canada ought to be picking up on uh, in terms of moving it forward. Um, so that was a little tip in, in a tiny, tiny little um, opportunity I did have to, to talk with him is, is he felt, you know, as, as an author himself, he felt he made it really easy for Canada and Canada didn't pick up on how easy it was for them to, to, to look at it from that standpoint. So, but I, I see your point and I think, you know, Chief, we should, uh, you should reach out to him and have a uh, good substantial dialogue because, yeah there's nobody better in terms of looking at uh, the UN deck other than him. Yeah, and if I can just follow, if you need any help with that, I'd be happy to help. I, I do know him and uh, he, he's brilliant in this area. So if we're going to take a position on this and have a strategy going forward, uh, I think that's a good move to do it. Thank you. I, I, I agree 100% and we'll definitely follow up with that. Uh... With that as well, thank you for that, Wendy um, and Nathan. Uh, I want to shift over to uh, Councillor Audrey. I already asked my question three people ago. I didn't have my hand up. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, there was someone else who had their hand up. Did they not? Maybe I I messed that up, or was it just Wendy? Oh, your Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> may I I'm, I'm starting to become like Audrey. I might I may have to uh, throw a, a quarter in the uh, in the mute bank. <laughs> Thank you. My, <laughs> my apologies. Okay, uh, Council. Then that being said, are there any uh, further questions or comments uh, to the discussion? Just one more. Nathan? Yeah, just one more. I think one of the things we should monitor. Um, I, I'm pretty sure this is gonna get Royal Ascent in terms of the work, but um, if we can get the letter in before Royal Ascent and get that registered with Lamani's office with our concerns, I think that's advantageous for us. 
And the other piece, if you look at it and for council to consume for a later date is um, the coup briefing note contemplates uh, a funding proposal um, coming out of coup for regional support uh, on further work on this. Uh, and one of the options they, they wanted to um, input on options, one of them was for PTOs and, and you know, First Nations like us to get uh, some support as well. So if that's something we want to in terms of a longer term piece on this, uh, that's uh, available to us. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nathan, for, for all of your work on this file. Uh, again, just want to look to any further questions or comments prior to moving to uh, looking to the recommendations. Is there any further questions or comments? If not, recognizing the, the time sensitivity around this, uh, just my only question, if I, if I may uh, look to at least uh, Nathan, if I could have your assistance on, on a, on a co-draft, just so that we highlight the key areas and points that you've raised. I wanna make sure that that's included uh, in the letter. If, if you could assist me with that, that would be great. Sure. And if Perfect. you need I appreciate that. You need a motion, I'll move it. Perfect, that's exactly what I was moving to next. So thank you, uh, Nathan, the motion's been made. It's been moved by Nathan Wright. Is there a seconder to the effect? Second by Michelle. Are there any further questions or comments? If not, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Uh, motion to waive second reading. Moved by Nathan, seconder. Second by Michelle. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Uh, I'll then now look to recommendation two, uh, which is again, another letter to be drafted in support of AIAI uh, in their opposition uh, to the federal government's under legislation. Uh, is there a motion to that effect as well? Mover, moved by Nathan, seconder, Audrey. Are there any further questions or comments? If not, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Uh, motion to waive second reading. Move, mover, moved by Audrey, seconder. Second by Nathan. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. And again, just for, for those watching on Facebook, a second reading basically means that action is gonna be uh, moved uh, right away on the, on the previous motion. So we'll look uh, to those letters getting out as soon as possible, Nathan. Okay, council, uh, thank you for that. That being said then, uh, I wanna then now shift back to our agenda. If you, if you can go back to the general council agenda. So we've done all of our delegations. Uh, we'll move into the adoption of the general council minutes and actions of November 24th. But just before uh, I, we move into that item council, and again, I wanna apologize for, for being late this evening. Again, I wanna thank uh, Councilor Michelle for, for opening and chairing the meeting. Uh, while I was getting to the next meeting. Uh, the last went longer than anticipated. So again, just wanna apologize for that. Uh, but I do just wanna, I, one of my, my uh, goals that I wanted to have prior to opening general uh, this evening is to uh, really uh, acknowledge um, and send our most heart, heartfelt uh, and sincere uh, condolences uh, to our families who are in, in mourning at this time. Uh, there's been uh, some tragic uh, events that have taken place uh, in our community uh, and you know, just leading up to the holidays. Uh, I, really, uh, I really just wanna take a moment of silence um, for those families that are hurting. Um, and so if, if I can ask, uh, for council, just a quick moment of silence uh, for our community and our families during this difficult time.
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Council, for that. Again, uh, I just want to send our, our heart, heartfelt and most sincere condolences to uh, in all the our families and community hurting during this time. And just to know that the, we do have our teams uh, of health services and our crisis response all available and services available for any, uh, any ind individuals that, that need that assistance. So thank you, Council. Uh, the next piece then I'll move into if we can move to the general council minutes and action items of November 24th. Chief, I'll move the minutes. I didn't see the I'll action second. item though. I'll second the minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle. It's moved by Michelle and second by Carrie. Are there any uh, further questions or comments to the minutes? Okay, that being said then, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, uh, motions carried. Uh, there is an action item tab within your Dropbox. Uh, just wanna shift over to that again. This action item, uh, this action item list is, is gonna continue to grow. <laughs> uh, I know there's only four items on there with one outstanding item. The rest have been completed. Uh, but again, this is, uh, again, a working and moving item council uh, in that we continue to look to uh, follow up on, on action required on motions. Uh, so just want to uh, look to a motion to accept uh, the action item list as presented. If I just, we are working on the ethics just for everyone's information. Uh, Dwayne and I um, have had a couple of reviews of that, um, so it is in progress. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Darren. Are there any further questions or comments to the action item list? Again, this is a, a work in progress as we move forward with this list uh, and be sure to see that it's going to definitely increase uh, in terms of action. Uh, can I then look to a mover and seconder to accept the action item list? I'll move. Move by Carrie, seconder. I'll second this, Melba. Second by Melba. Are there any further questions or comments? Mark, can we just for in the reference column? Can we have that filled in, Wendy? just so we know what it's pertaining to? Yes. So that that was uh, yes. So in terms of that, that we added that that piece for the also to include uh, in the uh, the motion number as well. I think that was also raised. So that's that's part of the uh, working progress. So yes, definitely duly noted, and we'll look to those changes. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, if not, then all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none then, motions carried. Uh, we'll now move into the recommendations from the Human Services Committee, uh, recommendation 7A. I have a question, Mark. Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, just really quickly, Audrey, you're on mute. I know you're the mover on that piece, uh, but before I go to uh, Audrey, I'll just really quickly go to Wendy, question. Yeah, a couple of questions. So recommendation 7B and 7C, 
I'm just questioning why they're on there as a motion. Is that not, I mean, if somebody wants to be on the agenda, they just ask to be on the agenda. And with paramedics, that's administrative, right? So I'm just wondering why we yeah. have on that. And then with the other ones, the only thing that I was able to find in my Dropbox and through email was documentation for 7D. There's no other documentation that I found for the remaining motions. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for those pieces. I agree. I think we need to figure out when we go to uh, when it gets to the committee level when they're providing updates, obviously that you're right, correct? That that's an administrative issue so that it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a motion to that effect uh, in regards to uh, the other pieces of, of, of missing information to the remaining resolutions uh, I'm going to look to I believe our director of health services is is on the line um, that can speak to that however I do again recognize that our council uh, should be briefed as much as possible leading into these uh, these meetings so that again we're prepared uh, and again have any uh, duly questions uh, that we may have so again I do recognize the update pieces that you've raised 7 B and C um, so those to me are also administration and, and can be just provided as an update as we do through our delegation and presentation portion of the agenda um, so we'll look to the deferring those two items. I don't think they necessarily have to be on the agenda as well. So 7B and C, we'll look to deferring those items, but just um, leading into E, F, and G, I'm gonna look to, uh, at this time, uh, uh, again, to our director, Lori Davis-Hill, uh, to further have uh, backup information to those pieces. Um, but again, we will look to moving forward and I know we try our best and I know our team administratively is working uh, as best as they can and quickly to make sure that the, all the items are uploaded to the Dropbox. Um, so we'll continue to work on those pieces, Wendy, for that. Uh, I just now will go to uh, recommendation 7A, uh, Councillor Audrey. I'm off of mute. I move. <laughs> Human Services Committee recommends to the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council that Sandra Mentor, the Corsair Executive Director, represent Six Nations of the Grand River at the First Nations Women's Caucus. Second, Melba. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Now, questions or comments, uh, Nathan? Yeah, can we just add, um, make clarity to the motion? And so right at the end, before it says First Nations Women's Caucus at Chiefs of Ontario, because I'm assuming that's where this is, um, it's the only Women's Caucus I'm, I'm aware of, and then a time frame for the, the appointment as well. Because I, I think this is a, I don't, I don't know if she keeps coming back for a reappointment or, but yeah, just a time frame for the appointment. I agree. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Nathan. If we can include those pieces, that's okay with the mover and seconder. Fine. That's good. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Audrey. Melba, question and comments. Wendy? Yeah, that was my question too. What What is the First Nations Women Caucus? Where does it belong? And the other thing is, given that um, Sandy Mentor is under yes. a different entity and a different board, we can't direct her. So is this an ask to do this? Just the way that the motion is, is, is written. Like we don't have authority over, over her. Do, so, do, you, do you mean in a sense of, uh, sorry, I'm just, I'm just looking back to the motion in terms of uh, that the elected council, uh, that Sa Sandra Montour, the Gnocostra executive director represent so is that what you're you're referring to? Is that terminology? I, I assume that she's already been consulted to want to even want to represent. Well, well that's why that's my question, right? Because as the elected council, we're saying that she can represent us at the women's caucus, but we don't have the authority to give that. So is, are we asking her to represent us at the Chiefs of Ontario Women's Caucus? There's no document. Just some guesswork here. I, yeah, I, I, uh, I understand. Malba? And thank you for that, Wendy. I'm going to shift over to the mover and seconder. Malba may have some input on this. 
Yeah, she did do a presentation, and uh, she asked that she represent, and it's my understanding, to this um, uh, recommendation that she be allowed to represent Six Nations. I think it's important that Council know that and give authority to that. So I don't understand the, uh, <laughs> the misunderstanding. I think, I think it's, it's just a clear. point of yeah, it's just a a point of clarification uh, that Councilor Johnson is raising. Um, so again, uh, thank you for that, Melba. I don't know if there's anything further if that covers or yeah, answers sure, your question, true. Wendy. So we're approving her request to be the representative. It's just a word change. I mean, I have absolutely no problem <laughs> with Sandy representing, but I mean, we have to be clear on what we're saying, right? 100 percent and then that's that's what i just now also look to is it's it's basically just like two words <laughs> uh sherry lynn yeah that's pretty much it she was she's been doing it since last council and they just wanted um, a motion from this council to have her sit there okay uh so if we can make those noted changes uh uh shirley uh, as well as the noted changes uh, that have been accepted by the mover and seconder in terms of Nathan's comments as well. Are there any further questions or comments to the motion? If not, then all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Uh, motion to waive second reading. Moved by Audrey. Seconder? Second. Second. Second by Melba. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Uh, we'll then now shift down to recommendation 7D. Are you on 7D? My apologies, sorry, Mel, but seven D as in dog. <laughs> we oh, deferred okay. B. Uh, can, D. <laughs> yes. can I ask for further clarification as to why this recommendation does not stand as it is? B as well as C. So B and C is, is to provide an update to full council, which we've just determined again as more of an administrative duty. It's not saying that they're not going to be done. It's just saying in terms of the process of emotions not needed to that effect. Well, it needs to be provided to full council, the information to say that they would like to do that. 100%. Is there something wrong with that? that so, no, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. We're just saying in terms of, of, of the process of, of providing an update to we're still looking to, so basically these should be shifted over to our action item list as opposed to a motion. There's not necessarily okay. uh, a need for a motion to this effect. So we're re really, it's just a process thing. Nobody is disagreeing. We want to hear these updates. It's a matter of process being shifted over to the action yes. item list and making sure these updates happen. That sounds good. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Malba. So then I'll then shift down to 7D as in dog. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll, I'll recommend that uh, the Six Nations Human Services Committee recommend to the Six Nations of the Grand River Electric Council to approve the, looks like flow, I can't see the, and management policy. I can't to see that. To approve the fall. To approve the fall prevention and management policy. So it's been moved. Seconder. Second by Audrey. Now open for further questions and comments. It's Lori. I would um, recommend we add in health services, Six Nations Health Services fall prevention and management policy. It was an oversight. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Lori. Uh, just again, Shirley, if you can do your thumbs up that you've noted that change. Perfect, thank you, Shirley. Are there any further questions or comments? 
If not, then it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Uh, I'll now then shift down uh, to 7E. Did you want that waived, Mark? Uh, I'm going to actually shift over to Lori on that piece. Lori, did you need second reading wa waived on 7D? Yes, so we can finalize our policy, please. I'll waive. Okay, thank you, Lori. Right, Melba. Thank you. Thank you, Melba. Motion to waive second reading moved by Melba. Seconder, Audrey. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none? Uh, motions carried. Uh, we'll now move into 7E. Recommendation 7E. I'll move that the Six Nations Human Services Committee recommends to the Six Nations, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Grand River Electric Council to approve the chair of the Six Nations Family Health Team Board to be granted the authority to bind the cooperation of the Six Nations of the Grand River, <clears throat> excuse me again, Family Health Team. I so move. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Uh, are there any further questions or comments? Uh, Wendy? So th this is, I think, as of, I looked at my Dropbox and there's nothing in there on these these motions. So I, I have a question for the mover and the seconder. So what does the agreement say on this that we have? Because we established a, a board and there were terms to that. What does the agreement say? Do we need to amend that agreement? And what's the risk in doing this? What risk of liability do we carry? I think it Thank is you, in our uh, policies. Yeah, that the Family Health Team Board be granted the authority. And but, I'm not aware of I'm not aware of any risk. Well, if it's in the policy, <laughs> you don't need a motion if it's already there. To the approval of the chair. I'm wondering if, if Lori, if you can shed any light on this piece. So the memor the memorandum of understanding that is between the Six Nations Family Health Team and board was um, implemented, uh, but it's been it's taken some time to actually roll out. So I think this is just a confirmation um, of that agreement. Um, this is. This was fully signed, uh, so I'm not sure why it didn't make it into your Dropbox. So, so if, uh, if I'm hearing your... Oh, so, sorry, my apologies. Go ahead, Wendy. So we have the MOU and this is in the MOU. So do we need to make a motion for this specific item to give the chair the authority or are we just approving the MOU? If it's already in there and we've already signed the MOU and it's a part of it, then why are we pulling out this section and making a motion on it? Because these are just it's to provide more clarity because the, the questions have been have, there has been discussion about who has signing authority, who doesn't have signing authority. So um, even though the memorandum of understanding exists, the family health team still is functioning. It, it's 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 uh, under the human services committee and under health services and so this is just to to make a clear statement so that everyone is um fully apprised of what has been agreed to so shouldn't it be written as that that we, we are providing clarification of what the agreement says and then spell out the details of that because the way it says the way it looks here when you interpret it is we're making different motions where we would have to amend the agreement so if it's going through to provide clarity on the agreement, that's something different. I would agree. And I hoped I would I hoped that Zach would be here to answer that, but I don't see him online. 
Yeah, that being said, then again, uh, again, apologize, Council. Uh, again, I don't know if uh, obviously there will be further briefings to this in uh, the people to answer the questions. However, I've, looking to Lord, is there a time sensitivity to this? Um, I would be comfortable to defer it, bring it back to human services, provide more clarity and uh, review it in January. Does that need it? Okay, thank you. Sorry, Wendy? E, F, and G, because they're all related, right? Yeah, that would take they're care all of all three of those. Yep. So we'll, we'll circle back, uh, provide more clarity, make sure that you have the package in your Dropbox, and um, we'll take it back through Human Services to reword the motions and uh, hopefully get more clarification for you next time. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Is there any opposition to, to that uh, direction, Council? Okay, if not, thank you, Lori, for, for that. That being said, then we're going to defer items E, F, and G for further clarification to go further back to the Human Services Committee and provide uh, a more clarity in wording uh, to the motions. Uh, that being said, then, Council will lead us into our scheduling portion. Um, political, uh, sorry, we had our general finance uh, yesterday. Uh, our general council meeting uh, is currently uh, right now. Tomorrow morning, the building and infrastructure committee uh, will be meeting, uh, leading into also as well, uh, I'm on the line all day at the AFN uh, virtual, uh, virtual meeting. Uh, as well, uh, leading into next week, uh, we'll then look to our scheduled meeting now. That was just uh, uh, confirmed this evening on the 15th, Tuesday at 9 a.m., a special council regarding uh, the schools. Uh, so we'll look to that. If council, if you can add that into your schedules, uh, then we'll shift over to corporate and emergency services. Uh, and as well, leading into the following week, uh, up into our closure, of general finance on the Monday uh, and Tuesday uh, being our uh, last uh, for 2020, that is council, general council meeting uh, on the 20, December 22nd. Are there any uh, missing meetings or anything uh, from anyone, any other counselors that you would like to add to the schedule looking to Councillor Nathan? Yeah, I thought uh, we scheduled uh, December 23rd for the first environment meeting. We did. Perfect. Thank you for that, Nathan. Uh, I believe you're you're the chair as well, correct? I think that's why I had it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I okay. think he is. Thank you. Yeah, Chief, Chief, long, okay, as thank you. Long, long as it's Chief, as long as it's in the morning, that's fine. Um, you know, we're trying to work, organize something for staff in the afternoon. But uh, also just, just a point on that, there was an action item related to that on the environmental committee in terms of reference. And I know Dwayne, Dwayne has found uh, previous versions. So we'll, we'll get that to uh, we'll get that um, fixed up and ready, ready for that meeting. That's, that's great. Thank you for that, Darren. I also want to maybe, and maybe we could talk further at the 23rd meeting uh, in regards to food sustainability. Uh, I know there's there's some work happening around that as well. I'm, I'm wondering if maybe this falls under environment. Again, looking for the terms of reference and the mandate of the environment committee. Uh, but again, if that doesn't, uh, I want to look to furthering uh, that uh, initiative as well. So I'll, I'll look to the environment committee. Maybe we can have a discussion around that piece as well. Uh, political liaison. Regularly, it's scheduled for the 28th. Uh, do we want to then... I'll uh, look to uh, scheduling that uh, this this month, or do we want to look to the new year for political liaison? Again, uh, looking for further direction from council on that piece. Chief, I would Nathan? suggest, yeah, I would suggest new year. It's not like we can action anything out of there. Yeah, and to be honest, I think what we've just done with the UNDRIP and all those items, those were brought up from political liaison, so that we're actually actionizing those items. So I, I, I kind of agree with you as well. I think that uh, will be more uh, be more suitable uh, to uh, reconvene in the new year with political liaison, as I believe we've we've uh, captured all those items at that. Is that okay with the rest of council? Okay, uh, silence. 
at times to me means yes. <laughs> okay, thank you for that, Council. Uh, I do wanted to shift over to uh, Michelle. I know, thank you again for being the chair and starting this meeting. Was there any new business items? Yes, we had Councillor Wright and I actually wanted to just share one more thing. Okay, so I will then look to uh, Councillor Wright for we'll now shift into new business items. Uh, Nathan, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks. And I might need a bit of your help on this one, see if it's the um, the minister. Uh, the COVID minister's um, vaccine distribution task force. So brought it up yesterday. Um, got some more information today. Um, <clears throat> basically, uh, what we know right now is in terms of the distribution of the vaccine for COVID-19, uh, the distribution, um, storage, um, handling, all the logistics are being handled through this task force. Um, the provinces and territories are solely responsible for the distribution storage as well as delivery. Um, so that's why all these task forces are being set up. And some of the information we know at this point in time is 2004 or 249 uh, uh, doses uh, are expected in Canada by the end of the year. Out of those 249,000, um, 80 5,000 uh, are earmarked for Ontario. Out of those 85,000, 40,000 are earmarked for Indigenous communities. So keep in mind when, uh, when I say 40,000 um, doses, uh, an individual requires two doses. So those 40,000 account for 20,000 people. So we also were made aware last week that Ontario Regional Chief Roseanne Archibald is on the Ministerial's COVID-19 uh, Vaccination Distribution Task Force, long name. Um, and if those folks that are following the media know that um, I believe it's uh, retired General Rick Hilliard, uh, former Chief of Defence Staff, um, Canadian military, he's chairing this particular task force. And the task force is made up of doctors, um, you know, professionals, academics, uh, infectious disease consultants. Um, uh, the, um, I believe there's a former chief of police on there. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, the Ontario Regional Chief. So they're basically coming up and, and working day and night to come up with the planning of, of the distribution. So the other piece of information information we know is the first dosage we're getting is Pfizer and Pfizer requires cold storage and you can only move Pfizer once, it only can be moved once. Um, so it, it, it's going to be very tricky in terms of doing the logistical aspects and the planning. Uh, Chief and I learned today that to support the COVID-19 um, vaccination distribution task force, there is a sub um, committee uh, and I understand that it's specific to First Nations. Um, and uh, so that is coming forward. Um, we learned that today. Uh, I don't have much more information on the Chief, if you can share a little bit more on what you had on that. But that particular um, committee, as I understand, uh, will be set up to support Roseanne and her advocacy on the, on the broader table. Um, so I think at this point, um, I know EG has been doing its planning um, and we have uh, this task force that's coming into place and I think the job that we have to do is, is meld both strategies now. Uh, look at the distribution and what's coming out from Ontario uh, and then meld that in with ours. You know, we got the cold storage, we got the handling, what's the procedures, all those aspects have to be rolled out. Um, so the one good thing um, that also came out today is we're going to start getting that real-time data around these pieces <clears throat> because chief you brought it up earlier uh, there is that real concern because we've been identified indigenous people has been identified as kind of the first um, quote unquote guinea pigs of this um, so we will be getting it first as well as um, you know long-term planning and health professionals indigenous people kind of lump into those pieces um, as information comes we'll, we'll be starting to to generate that coming out so 
I think for the most part is, um, you know, we, we couldn't really get a written update to you today that all this is happening mm -hmm. in real time, it's been, you know, announced on December 4th. Uh, so we will be looking to get uh, as much information as possible. Uh, but that's uh, verbally, that's the information we have. I don't know, Keith, if I missed anything, uh, just turn it back over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that update, Nathan, and as well, thank you for joining this morning on, on that uh, on that call and important discussion. Uh, I think one of the the other areas, uh, it's obviously the subcommittee uh, that Nathan has alluded to is going to be driven by Minister, uh, Minister Rickford. Um, and I think that's more along the lines of uh, having those technical conversations. So, you know, I, I know it was brought, Nathan, I brought it up to you know, having potentially even a representative from our emergency control group on that subcommittee. So we'll definitely advocate so that our representation is there. Um, and Nathan, I, I'm pretty looking through my notes. You've basically covered uh, everything. There are seven companies, I think, total that is still in the in the really uh, mix of all of this. Uh, I'll also uh, look to uh, sharing a link that was uh, just a Pfizer's, just to go back really quickly to the seven, I think it, Pfizer, Medico, AstraZeneca, Xanifo, Johnson & Johnson, Novavax, and uh, Moderna are all uh, the companies that are vying for this uh, uh, vaccination. Obviously, nothing has been Health Canada approved to date. Uh, but again, that's what the government is, is working uh, uh, tirelessly on, getting that approval. But uh, again, it was very, uh, there was many good questions posed by multiple chiefs on the meeting this morning. Um, and again, uh, you know, Nathan alluded to the fact of, you know, uh, First Nations kind of being the guinea pigs of this vet vaccination uh, and recognizing, you know, uh, the importance of this. And again, you know, just my personal perspective is that, you know, just speaking for myself, I know, like, even, for example, the flu shot, I mean, it all ultimately comes down to, you know, um, personal choice, right? And I think uh, that's, again, want to best advocate for for our, our community on this vaccination and in the case of, uh, you know, members wanting wanting it, but ultimately, I, you know, it's nothing that's imposed or mandatory and looking to ultimately personal choice. So again, that's just my personal opinion on, on that take, but I'm gonna open it now up for any questions or comments. I see Councillor Wendy. Yeah, thanks for that, Nathan and, and Mark. So I, I'm trying to think, I actually read a document on this and, Part of the rollout there that was online and I don't know the legitimacy of it but it's actually a na national defense document that kind of talks about the track one and and how they're proceeding and, and what the involvement is and part of that was the um, the coal storage and making sure that if it goes to indigenous communities that that coal storage is provided so however they roll those pieces out but I thought there was a, a, a listing actually that went through and it was number one elderly uh, making sure that they elderly people had the vaccine, those in, in homes and so on. And then the second tier was medical personnel. So people in hospitals, healthcare facilities, they would be next in line for the vaccine. And then third was indigenous and looking at remote communities. Um, that was one of the pieces in brackets. So unknown if it would even get to us in the South in, in terms of that, or if they are looking at the remote factor. And there was a fourth category but I'm trying to just lose me right now but um, I, I'm just thinking what is the communication strategy I mean it's great that you're both involved in hearing that but there are so many questions from the community is there anything that we can start to set up so that we have either discussion sessions or something on the radios um, that are starting to talk about this and what what is the reality what does it mean for us here at Six Nations and what can we expect to see and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a lot of doubters. They don't trust it. I mean, looking historically at what's happened um, to, to us um, in the past, but what does this mean? I mean, I have some comfort knowing that medical personnel will, will get it first, you know? So um, I don't think we, we want to do away with all our healthcare staff. So um, there's gotta be some, some legitimacy to it. So anyhow. So the communication piece is what I'm looking at. Yeah, I, I just want to shift over. I know Nathan, you you brought that piece up, so I just want to I want to revert to you. And if there's anything that I can maybe assist you or add to, but 
Nate, Nate's been the communication guy thus far, so I want to shift that to, to Nathan. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks for that, uh, Wendy. Um, we, I, I kind of raised a portion of that today with um, just in terms of what to expect, because uh, basically there is uh, that discussion. We need to um, basically work with our ECG because the information coming from the ministerial task force is going to be very high level, um, very technical. And then we have to be able to translate that into um, real time data. So uh, the question I asked today was, was related to when can we expect to get the real time data so that we can start disseminating that information, absorbing it, doing the analysis, turning it around and, and, and doing those discussions just as you highlighted. I got today was next week we'll we'll start receiving some data so we, we can get some of those pieces into the ECG in the first tranche of uh, material we're starting to get will be kind of that dispel the myth uh, about, the, uh, about the, the vaccination what it does what it doesn't and, and how that's going to be translated for us uh, but I think the important piece is, is ECG starting to get the information so they can turn that around and we can start um, Community, because you're absolutely right. Uh, though that's the critical piece going forward. So I got the commitment uh, today that I start seeing that information next week. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Nathan. Uh, are there any uh, further questions or comments uh, to this discussion? At this time, again, I, I don't think there's necessarily any specific re, uh, action required or motion needed, um, but I'm just, uh, again, thank you, Nathan, for providing this update. I know uh, the subcommittee is really where we're going to get a majority of these answers. I just want to go really quickly over to the chat, uh, uh, confirming uh, that the, the, is, it true, is it true that the, there are 40,000 doses coming to First Nations total across Canada? I'm not sure if was there a number, Nathan. I, your best to answer that piece. Yes. Yeah, so the the forty thousand is just specific yeah. to Ontario. Ontario, that's right. And those forty thousand doses only translate into twenty thousand people, uh, First Nations people. Right, and it, it was and that was one of the comments from the ORC as well. Right, is it's really highly re reliant on the the data of of the numbers that have been the cases confirmed per province as well. I know she touched a little bit on that, correct? Which is ultimately which led to that number of the of the first uh, the first uh, shipment. So that uh, yeah, and I think it was related to the transmission rates of, of other provinces right. being where they were. That's right. Uh, okay, so thank you, uh, thank you, Nathan, for for clarifying that. Are there any further questions or comments? Again, more information will 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 provide updates as as more information becomes available, um, and we'll make sure that we're keeping this abreast at the ECG level as well as uh, making sure representation is at that subcommittee level. I feel I feel like that's where it's going to be really key uh, to make sure we're getting the most up to date and recent information for our community to then determine our next steps of communication to our community. I don't know if there's any further points uh, that you would like to add, Nathan, or does that sum it up until our next update? I think that's good till our next update. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Council. Is there any further questions or comments for Nathan or myself? Okay, if not, then I will shift over to uh, Councillor Michelle uh, for her okay. item. Thanks, Chief. And mine is, is more promotion. Um, I think we all know that the community-minded spirits in action have been bringing the Santa Claus Parade to our community for the last 28 years. Unfortunately, this year, um, we cannot have a parade. However, um, in memory of the late Kathy Hanyost and Ange Paulus, who were instrumental in, in always ensuring the parade was happening, um, the committee is going to do a Santa Claus cruise. So on Saturday, this Saturday coming up, um, they will be starting at uh, Little Buffalo and going all the way down Cheesewood to Six Line, turning around, going through the trail, going through the lodge, 
um, just to promote some holiday cheer. So it's a partnership with the Red Drum Group as well as Six Nations Police. So I wanted to give them a little bit, prom a little promotion this evening. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michelle. It's it's really uh, enlightening to see all the creative minds come together in such unprecedented times. Uh, so again, you know, looking to if there's any additional support that they may need, uh, uh, I will definitely uh, look to make myself available if need be as well. Yep, perfect, thanks. And, and they're encouraging everybody, stay in your vehicle, right? Santa's gonna go by, he's gonna be, you know, saying Merry Christmas, but uh, at the end, there's no candies given out. We just wanna be able to uh, have little kids see him go down the road and through the village. He's, he's gonna spread some Christmas cheer. <laughs> we can all use that, some cheering up. That's great, thank you for that, uh, Michelle. Uh, that being said then, uh, are there any further questions or comments uh, for our open session? Okay, seeing or hearing none, I also just wanna uh, take this time to acknowledge and commend our uh, communications team, as well as Shirley uh, Johnson uh, and Tammy, everyone who has made this uh, our, our first live uh, to our community of our, of our meetings. This is uh, ultimately our goal is to make sure all of our general finance and general councils moving forward are live streamed even when we get back to the chambers and in person, uh, we are equipped to uh, have our meetings uh, recorded and again, live on those levels. Again, this is uh, in uh, collaboration and really promoting and looking to communication. I know all this council is taking communication, accountability and transparency very seriously. Uh, and I feel uh, very proud uh, that our community uh, can join us uh, through the comfort of their homes and to get involved in the discussion. Uh, so just want to make those uh, comments as well. Uh, that being said, uh, I'll look to then a motion to adjourn the open session, looking for a mover and seconder. Moved by Wendy, second by Nathan, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Thank you uh, everybody for joining us this evening. Council will now shift in and get prepared uh, for the in-camera portion. So we'll just take a two minute break uh, and get uh, switched over to the next agendas. Uh, thank you again to everybody. <laughs>